All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the September 24th, 2024 meeting of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors. I'd like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig. Here. Friend. Here. Hernandez. Here. McPherson and Cummings. Here. Um, I'd like to see if there's any member of the board who would like to dedicate today's moment of silence. Seeing none, we will just... Mr. Oh. Chair, I'd actually like to dedicate the moment of silence to Paul Elric. Uh, Paul was... Uh, a remarkable member of this of this broader community, unbelievably politically and socially justice involved, uh, worked with so many of us during so many campaigns, even ran for county supervisor a couple decades ago, uh, but was a beloved member of the Aptos community, volunteered in local sports programs. Uh, he'd be terribly missed. He was just so inextricably linked with so many of the good things in Santa Cruz County. I just hope this board can acknowledge him. Thank you. All right. With that, we'll take a moment of silence for Paul Elric. Y'all join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic of Spain, one nation under God, if it is for all, if it is for all. Before we begin, I'd like to do a land acknowledgement. The land on which we gather is the unceded territory of the Waswa speaking Yupi tribe. The Amamutsan tribal band comprised of the descendants of indigenous people taken to Mission Santa Cruz and San Juan Batista during Spanish colonization of the Central Coast is today working hard to restore traditional stewardship practices on these lands and heal from historic trauma. Um, I'd like to ask uh, CAO Carlos Blasius if there's any additions or deletions to the agenda today. Uh, yes, we have one correction on the agenda. On the consent agenda, item number 22, that staff request item is deleted. Uh, remove packet pages 216 through 223. Yeah. Um, are there any members of the board who would like to remove an item from consent to the regular agenda today? Okay. Seeing none, uh, we'll go ahead and open up for public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the public to uh, comment on items that are on our consent agenda or items that are not on our agenda. And you can speak to an item on our regular agenda. Just know that you are not able to speak to that item when it's going to be heard later today. And so with that, I'll open up public comment and we'll start um, with our first member who's here in person. You'll have two minutes. On April 14th, 2022, Department of Health and Human Services Secretary Javier Becerra said, quote, we know these vaccines are killing people of color, black, Latino, indigenous people at about two times the rate of white Americans. Yes, that's a shocker. I'll repeat it again. He said, we know these vaccines, talking about the COVID-19 vaccines, are killing people of color, black, Latino, indigenous people at about two times the rate of white Americans. My name is Ronald F. Owens, Jr. I was a public information officer at the California Department of Public Health for nearly 15 years. I retired on December 31st. But during the time that I was there, I brought this information to my management. Look. I'm this black guy, and I'm telling my two white superiors, we know these vaccines are killing people of color, and my white superiors disciplined me. I had to retire so this information would not be withheld from you and 40 million other Californians. They made it about me and not about you. On July 29th this year, I sent this board a five-page memo detailing what Javier Becerra said, who I am, and studies from Germany, Italy, and Japan that are talking about the COVID-19 vaccines. Supervisor McPherson, you and I have history. I worked at the California Newspaper Publishers Association between 1987 and 1992, and it's good to see you again. Supervisor Friend, as a PIO, you know that when there is misinformation that is stated by a public official, they always correct the record. That information is still on the White House's YouTube channel. I urge this board to discontinue promoting, administering, and distributing COVID-19 vaccine. Thank you for your time. Excuse me. Just as a matter of practice, I'd like to ask that you please not applaud. You can use spirit hands to show your support. We want to be respectful of everyone's opinion. Hello. My name is Ruth Garland, and I've lived in the county for 50 years. I'm a retired 
registered nurse. Ma'am, can you speak into the microphone? Yeah. Thank I'm you. A retired registered nurse who worked in the county for 40 years. I watched over the decades how Big Pharma took control of our Western medicine. The doctors I worked with were once allowed to think for themselves and consult their colleagues and their patients' families for ideas and best practices. Now the doctors are virtually slaves who must follow the protocols written by Big Pharma. Pharma's only interest is in its own profits. The mRNA vaccines are neither safe nor effective. I hope you all can see that now. If you look around your family, friends, and neighbors, are people getting sicker? Are, are, are they well? Are people dying suddenly? Are people having heart attacks? Are people having turbo cancers? This is all vaccine related. I am fully vaccinated. My children are fully vaccinated. But when we came into the pandemic, something put up a red flag for me and we stopped. And I took a deep dive and started studying what was happening. And because of my medical background, I was able to follow the science into the wormholes and really take a deep dive and see what was happening. We are not being made healthier. I implore you to look in your own lives at the people around you and ask yourself, are people getting sicker or are they well? The people that are getting the shots are actually getting COVID more often, more often, more often. The people who are unvaccinated are still strong and healthy. Look for yourself. Be willing to take a peek into your own life. So I, these shots are very dangerous for the sake of our county, for the sake of our state. I implore you, do not keep pushing this vaccine. They're unsafe. Thank you. Request for apology for past harms and cessation of vaccine misinformation. Dear supervisors and all good people of Santa Cruz County, my name is Greg. I am a county resident of 23 years, a cancer survivor and administrator of the online discussion forum, Prostate Cancer Support on the Telegram app. I've been researching cancer as well as the COVID-19 pandemic Every day for the last three years, I've got thousands of pages. I'm going to try to stick a little bit in two minutes. I respectfully ask the county, Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors to warn residents about potential harms and to direct Santa Cruz County Health Officer Dr. Lisa Hernandez to stop promoting, administering, and distributing COVID-19 vaccines. The recent declaration of a pandemic emergency by unelected officials is claimed to have justified the abandonment of long-standing ethical principles in our society. Number one, the Nuremberg Code, which prohibited med medical experimentation without informed consent, was abandoned. Number two, the precautionary principle in medicine, which asserts that the burden of proof for potentially harmful actions by industry or government rests on the assurance of safety and that when there are threats of serious damage, scientific uncertainty must be resolved in favor of prevention. The Hippocratic Oath, first, do no harm. If the harms of these mRNA injections was largely unknown to the public in the early days of the pandemic, the same is not true today. More adverse events from these shots have been reported to the U.S. Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System in relation to these injections than for all prior vaccines. Trust in physicians and hospitals during the pandemic in a 50-state survey of U.S. adults. This is from the Journal of the American Medical Association, JAMA, which is not opposition research. Thank you, sir. Yes, that concludes your two minutes. Thank you. Okay. The study suggests that the COVID Sir, thank you. That concludes your two minutes. Hi, uh, my name is Keith McHenry, and, I, and I'm in support of SEIU. We will feed them if they go out on strike, like we did with the city workers. We will make sure they will get food. Now, also, this is super dangerous, their work. So my girlfriend from high school, Megan Williams, she worked for in adult care in Portland, Oregon. She had to get injected. She died of turbo cancer. Her husband died seven days before of turbo cancer working in the same care location. They had to be injected. They died. My uh, elementary school friend, best friend from elementary school, working at an adult their, uh, care center, leading an exercise class for elderly people, healthy as a horse. 
prop dad right there on the floor in the gym before all of his students. Um, the filmmaker that went the world with me, she was kidnapped with me in Nigeria. She argued, she asked me for in Australia, should I get the jab? Should I get the jab? I said, no, she couldn't take the lockdown anymore. She got the jab. She got myocarditis. So she survived. It's one of two of my friends that survived. My other friend, 57, she is permanently disabled in a care unit, 57 years old from the jab. Then my classmate, uh, in uh, my writing class for my memoir, she dropped dead of a heart attack at her house. I go to her Facebook page. Sure enough, she just posted where you can get free boosters. And then Dennis Atler died less than 24 hours after his second Pfizer shot here at uh, across from San Lorenzo Park. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Kathleen Lynch. I live in Aptos. I'm a licensed clinical social worker and a medical social worker. During COVID period, I worked at Dominican Hospital Home Health, and I also worked at Good Samaritan Hospital. Um, I was witnessing many patients injured by the COVID vaccines that were admitted to the hospital or in home health. Um, one particularly egregious case was a South Pacific Islander family in which um, two of the women in the family, the mother and grandmother, both got, after their job, got a very aggressive turbo cancer, and each of them were dead within a couple months of getting the cancer, which is not normal for cancer. Um, that was just one family lost two members. Um, I remember a young woman in her 20s with a blood clot in the ICU that I had to help. Um, I witnessed many, many cases of people with no pre-existing pre, pre um, uh, existing conditions uh, get massive strokes and heart attacks in both my jobs. Um, and also my coworkers were affected. One of my coworkers in her 20s got a turbo cancer and had to have both her breasts removed. I'm, I'm here to urge you, the County Board of Supervisors, um, to direct uh, the County Medical Director, Dr. Lisa Hernandez, to stop promoting and administering and distributing COVID-19 vaccines and to warn the public of the dangers. Um, to, in order to preserve and protect the public health. Um, there's um, a wealth of information out there. If you folks need more info, we would be happy to provide it at a future session. Thank you. Good morning, gentlemen. My name is Linda Mills. I am a IHSS care provider. We elected you to be the voice to speak for us. I know some jobs, people are put in position to look good, but that's not who you are. All I'm asking for is fair wages to support our families. You know the cost of living today is to the roof. We are barely getting by. Santa Cruz have a homeless crisis and I do not want to be a victim. If you did not know, there are some homeless people out there that, in, that have been in positions like you, ran their own companies one time or another, but their ego was too big and shame to ask for help. You or one of your family members may need a care provider one day. All I'm asking is please consider our struggle so we will not be a victim. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Maricela Lopez and I am here on behalf of the IHS program as well as uh, the lady that was right before me. And I'm just asking for you guys to actually look at what we make. I mean, our income at this point is pennies to you guys' pocket and to a lot of other people. 
But, you know, it's like what we know and what we do doesn't compare to anybody because everybody has their roles. And um, I know that what we do and what I can tell you is that we struggle through the day. We feed, we cook, we clean, we're nurses because we administer all of our patients' meds. I deal with a dementia person and this person needs my attention 24 seven. She cannot be by herself. She cannot, she gets lost in her own home. She cannot feed herself sometimes because she feels she's not hungry and she hasn't eaten. So you have to make sure she's eating. She, you have to make sure she gets all of the meds that she needs. This person actually needs your 24 seven attention. And I'm pretty sure you guys have an in-law, a mother, a father that needs your attention. A lot of these people also deal with special ed people that, you know, they're in wheelchair. They're, they have some other disability that it's not dementia. I deal with a dementia patient. So that's what I, I am here to speak about. I am just one person that does the essential job that it's a lot less than what it, uh, RN does or you know, somebody that you put in a hospital, you're going to spend a lot less with me than when we put them in the hospital. So think about it, guys. We actually need to actually be able to support ourselves so we can help them. We need to be healthy so we can help them. We cannot be, have a, not a, a healthy life so we can't, you know, help them. So think about it, guys. Thank you. Good morning, supervisors. I am a concerned community member. I am a retired registered nurse, and I am here to support the folks who are doing the frontline care out in our community. It's not a living wage. We all know that. And so how do we take care of these folks who are caring for the rest of our community members. It's not just about fair, it's essential. And our, our community is aging and people need to be aware of that. And who's gonna be caring for these folks? These people have a hard job. I've witnessed it over and over. And I urge you, please, to, to really take care of our caregivers. Thank you. Hello, supervisors. Uh, my name is Barbara Riverwoman. I'm 86 years old. My partner, Judy, uh, had a major disease. She died 13 years ago. And she had in-home support services. And I have never been so grateful to anybody in my life as the woman who cared for my partner who was 500 pounds when she died. She had lymphedema, serious. I always felt bad that Anna, her caregiver, had to go home after feeling, can't describe all the details of the service she gave my partner, but it was enormous and I hated to see her go home with all the responsibilities that she had at home and in her life you know with what, what would be $17 now and I read that in order to survive in Santa Cruz you need $36 minimum so there's no question in my mind that our community all of you and everybody in the all layers of the government need to take seriously, very seriously, the wages that are being given to our, as this woman said, frontline people providing, you know, a lot of hard physical labor and also intense emotional work. Thank you very much. Morning, Supervisors, I'm Ian McHenry. <coughs> Excuse me, I live in the second district. Uh, my parents live in the third district and I have a vacation home in the first district. So I got the majority of you all covered. Um, I'm here to talk a quick moment about uh, the vacation rental uh, item on the agenda put forward by uh, Supervisor Koenig and Supervisor Cummings. Um, and I want to dispel some of the uh, biases that are in that and some of the data around that. 
I have a fear that there is an intent to ban vacation rentals here or to severely limit them when they are not the cause of the housing problem here. We need to build, some, what is it, 4,600 units in the unincorporated, somewhere around there. In the next several years, there are 600 whole home vacation rentals, and they are necessary for supporting family tourism here. These are the places where families stay. And it, their impact is very minimal. Even in that report that you put together, it says a 10% increase from 600 to 660 would be a 0.4% impact on rent. So even if we doubled or doubled the number, 100% increase, that would affect rent by 4%. Can any of you say how much rent went up the last two years? It's a lot more than 4%. And there was almost no change in the number of permitted vacation rentals. I would love to hear you guys discuss that, the increase, because there seems to be a fear that these are like taking over when in fact they're not. They're growing very slowly and they are still less than 10% or about 10% of all accommodation. Hotels are the vast majority with over 4,600 units. And so if we're just going to try to build more housing, let's not focus on that. Let's focus on building more housing and supporting the people that stay in vacation rentals. Our families, I'm sure some of your families have visited, stayed there because a hotel can't accommodate a family. Fire victims, Supervisor Cummings, stayed in our own vacation rental. If they weren't there, there would be no flex for those types of people. So consider them in addition. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Kenneth Bear. I'm the city chapter president of SEIU 521. I have been invited to sit in on the negotiations uh, between you and SEIU 521 County. I have to tell you that after being president during our last strike, you are on the precipice of a strike yourself. I strongly suggest that you consider everything that's brought to you today in closed session and uh, help to get the employees a, a fair wage and uh, proper living conditions. Thank you and have a good day. Good morning. My name is Diana Verastica. I'm a benefits representative at the 500 Westridge building in Watsonville. I administer CalFresh and Medi-Cal benefits to the community. I have one particular case that I want to share with you. It is a single mother with two children who had a delay in her benefits because she did everything right. But because we're so understaffed and have been understaffed for the last 10 years that I've been in this position, our training takes nine months. So even when we hire, it is not a re immediate relief. And because of our caseloads, it is affecting the benefits that we issue. So she did everything correctly. She reported an address change to us, but our caseload is so heavy that we didn't process that timely. So that caused a delay in her benefits. She never got her report that she needed to complete. And um, she had to call in to request and wait like an hour and a half on the phone till somebody helped her which was me and, you know, issue the benefits for her, her and her two children. You know, these are the type of cases that we have that are affecting the community. Please, please, please help us retain our workers and help us with our caseloads because we're not asking for us. We're asking for the community. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Olivia Martinez. I'm the region two director. You all were elected because of your leadership. We saw something in you, right? When we canvassed for you, when we supported you, we saw that. We are not here because we want to. We're here because of a lack of leadership in your county. And it's not you. It's your department heads. It's your personnel. And they're not listening to your employees. These are your employees. At the end of the day, you are the bosses. And they have brought serious concerns. Zach, you met with folks a couple, a year ago. I think all of you guys met with workers down on MLI. And they brought to you serious concerns because they are committed to their community. We did not go on a strike on the 19th, not because we couldn't. Because I asked your employees to give me a week and a half to settle this contract. But yesterday, your bargaining team tried to lowball your employees. 
by asking them to accept an insurance and where they would pay more, asking them to accept less when they had no authority. They should have come to you before, before they came to us to negotiations. I will not accept this. And I have asked our attorney to send you a strike notice because we are done. We have waited enough and we're asking that you please intervene and help us settle this contract because the same thing that I did with the city, I will take this county to a strike. So thank you. Oh, my name is John Pickard. My wife and I own Beach Nest Vacation Rentals in Santa Cruz. I found what Ian said was very in informative, and I hope you guys take into account that when you create this ad hoc committee today, which I understand, Manow and Mr. Cummings, you are uh, leading this 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 uh, ad hoc committee. Um, I'm here to formally request that you guys stick somebody from a property management company on this ad hoc committee and somebody such as Ian, who is what we call a rent by owner on the committee, because you're going to get a very unique perspective that will be good for that community, right? I'll give you an example that he talked about, the CZU fire. It was a terrible time in our, in our community. We pivoted immediately in late August, managing at that point about 45 properties. My wife and I personally called every single vacationer who was going to come for Labor Day weekend, which we were sold out. And we had to cancel every single reservation. And we said to them, I'm sorry, our community is hurting right now. And we need the, they need us. We were concerned the outcome that that could have happened to our brand, to our people, to everybody. But we did it because it was the right thing to do. And we put 45 families in houses for up to a year and a half, two years, so they could so that they could pivot. That's the type of unique perspective you'll get if you include us in this ad hoc committee. I, I have the same fears that Ian has. The, mis the mistakes that were made with the city council and that ad hoc committee and the, and the course they did back in 2016, that was not good. And if you're planning on doing that again, you're going to hurt the community and everybody that works for that community, all the cleaners, all the plumbers, all the electricians, all the spa people we hire, all the employees we hire. So let's come together and figure out reasonable legislation if that's what you want to do, which I believe is already in place to get it done. So please invite one of us because I'm here on all of our behalf. Bailey's Cheshire. My time is up myself and your good friend, Hallie at Surf City. Please include us in this ad hoc committee. Thank you. Good morning. <clears throat> good morning. My name is Leon Canaro. I'm a retired school psychologist of 35 years. I've been involved in the vaccine issue going back to the early 90s when I noticed this sudden explosion in the amount of children that were becoming autistic. I did a lot of research. I looked into it, looked at what the science is showing, and it indicated quite clearly that this increase in uh, autism along with other chronic diseases was directly related to the fact that there was a uh, large increase in the number of vaccines that children were receiving starting around the 1990s. In 1960, children would receive five vaccine doses. They would receive the smallpox, the polio, and the DPT, diphtheria, pertussis, and tetanus. Today, children receive 25 vaccine doses by the time they're six months old. They receive the hepatitis B at birth, 12 hours after they come out of the womb. At two months, they receive eight more vaccine doses. At four months, they receive seven vaccine doses. And at six months, they receive nine more vaccine doses, all based on the recommended uh, vaccine schedule put out by the CDC. By the time children are 18 months old, they will receive 36 vaccine doses. This is the problem that we're seeing today with these chronic diseases that are exploding, not only in uh, uh, autism, cancers, autoimmune diseases, uh, sudden infant death syndrome, SIDS. All of these things uh, took off starting in the early 90s as a result of this enormous amount of vaccines that children started receiving. <clears throat> I don't expect you to believe anything I say, but I invite you to check out 
this information for yourself. I've written a book. Thank you so much. I to get to someone if they were actually. Thank you. Sir, please thank you. Your time's up. Yeah. Thank you, sir. If you might let the next person in line speak. Good morning, Chairman Cummings. Get to say that. Um, and good morning, Board of Supervisors. Um, I just want to stand here uh, to remind all of us that we all have our own grandparents, our grandma, our grandpa that we all love, um, that helped raise us in our own families. Um, I'll have to say that SEIU 2015 represents uh, the importance of our own grandparents being able to survive every single day. Uh, you know, in this community, in this chamber of, of, of progress, we are the architects of the future. And Santa Cruz prides itself on really being a progressive community. And I believe that in order for us to really meet the dignity and the health of every well-being person who's working in this community, including our in-home supportive services, we have to ensure that they're getting paid a fair living wage. $18.75 only meets about 80% of the necessary income in order to survive in Santa Cruz. And we know that fast food workers, McDonald's workers, folks are getting paid $20 an hour and they're not taking care of any grandparents. Okay. So I think we need to really rethink what we're doing and the signals that we're sending to our community, especially the ones that work on behalf of our community, especially the ones that ensure that the lives of our grandparents can survive every single day. We need to ensure that we're reflective on what we're doing to make sure that they're not just able to survive in Santa Cruz, but that they can thrive. Even the modest proposal that's being asked today is so modest and so humble. We should be able to approve this quickly and ensure that we're negotiating and working with the whole community to continue to raise their ability to live in Santa Cruz. We don't want folks who are supporting the vulnerable to be vulnerable themselves. We don't want folks who are struggling every day to ensure people can live, are struggling themselves to live themselves. We need to cut this cycle of poverty today. And that means that we need your support to get behind this workers' rights and to ensure that everyone has a right to live in this community. Thank you. Hola, buenos días um, para ustedes, uh, la Junta de Supervisores. Muchas gracias por tomar el tiempo. Uh, estoy representando el 2015. Uh, mi nombre es Emilia Sánchez y estoy aquí porque uh, queremos que sí, por favor, nos dan su voto para un aumento porque lo, lo necesitamos. Uh, yo tengo dos niños a los cuales... Yo cuido. Hello, good morning, Board of Supervisors. Uh, thank you for listening to us today. My name is Amelia Sanchez, um, and I'm here to ask that you uh, vote in favor of our uh, raise. Um, yo uh, tengo al cuidado a mis dos niños. Mi niña tiene uh, síndrome de Down y... Um, so I have uh, two young children. Uh, one of my one of my daughters, uh, she has Down syndrome. Necesitamos todos los que estamos aquí. Somos familias que de alguna forma cuidamos un familiar o tal vez no familiar, pero la persona que está al cuidado de nosotros ocupa de nosotros y nosotros ocupamos de ustedes para que nos aumenten el salario para tener una vida más digna. Um, so each one of us here takes care of someone, um, whether it's a family member or a community member, and the person that we take care of needs us. And we need you um, to please uh, raise our our wages. Thank you. Good morning, um, um, Board of Supervisors. My name is Helen Ruiz Thomas, and I'm a program coordinator for our County Clerk and Elections Department. Um, Mr. Brookmuth. 
Bruce McPherson. I just want to thank you. I don't know if you remember a few years back, I did a mock uh, board of supervisors meeting in here and you came by and saw all of the students from Santa Cruz High School in here. Um, sharing the experience of what it's like to sit on that side of the counter. Um, thank you for doing that. You were the only board of supervisors that came in attendance to, to support the kids and, and introduce yourself to them. So thank you for that. Um, I'm, I came up, decided to come up and talk to you today because I'm a single parent in Santa Cruz County. I can barely afford to stay here and work. Um, Echoing the other um, people that came up to talk on our behalf for a CIU 521 and, and our contract negotiations that we're currently um, experiencing, we have had a chronic problem with the management and administration for years. That's how we came to this position where we are one of the lowest paid counties in the area because of this type of approach to working with um, with SEIU, working with um, the employees here. We don't want to strike, but we are ready to do it. I can't afford to go any days without my money, but I will sacrifice. The person that volunteered to feed us, I will be one of those people taking advantage of that help because right now I can barely... I can barely afford to buy my own groceries and I have my full paycheck. So consider that, please. We are ready to strike. Regardless of what happens here today with you, we don't want to see that happen next week. So please consider that when you go and talk about what's going on with our contract negotiations right now. The majority of us, we are all in the same boat. We don't want to strike but we're down to do it because we feel we have been left no alternative. Thank you, Thank you so okay? much. Thank you. Thank you. Very Richard Arnold, uh, supervisors. Uh, the name seems to change, but the chain of command remains the same. We have a political machine here, uh, folks, and it's run by Leon Panetta. This man here, sir, sir, if you could speak into the microphone. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this man here, Leon Panetta, gave military and policy information to a, a Chinese communist spy aligned with a silver master Pearl of Swords and a bunch of others. And he has, uh, in fact, plaques on the courthouse steps, which is an insult uh, to the position. Uh, Exactly. Ten years ago, Mr. Cummins, uh, they pulled the same trick. Uh, and I don't know how they got you so trained so quick that the sheriff resigned and then they then you guys selected somebody new. You are not getting a chance to vote for your sheriffs or vote for people. They also don't tell you that there's a parallel government called CalCog. And it's a cog is a council of governments. It's a Soviet uh, they meet, they're supposed to or tell us about those meetings, what's going on. But it's run by the UN, the World Bank, and uh, a lot of uh, big uh, multinationals like the uh, Bank of America, etc. cetera. Um, I think most Mr. Hernandez and Mr. Cummings belong to the California League of Cities. And that was run or founded by uh, James Phelan, Keep California White. And while we have a moment of silence for some some activist that's a Marxist, uh, we have nothing talked about all the 500 million kids that have been killed by fentanyl and the trading in children. This guy also belongs to uh, Bohemian Grove, where they have a cremation of care for children. It exists today, and I believe some of you have even been there. Hello, um, I'm back here again. The first time I sat for the, or like came to public comment was working with when I was attend, like with working with Janice and they were making a union effort. Um, I'm now uh, working with the County of Santa Cruz as an associate marriage and family therapist uh, as a case coordinator, but I'm registered as an associate. Um, and 
I really just wanted to step up here and say that these are all people that I depend on as a coordinator. Our IHSS employees are so, so, so under-resourced that most of my job is sitting with my clients to call as many numbers as I can find to get even someone to answer the phone because they're so overworked. Um, let alone if we get them on the phone, maybe they only have two more days that they can offer because they already have someone that they see full time, but they're putting out the extra hours to feed their families. And I know how exhausted they are. I know that there are so many of my clients who absolutely would not be able to function independently in their home without them. And I, I, it just breaks my heart to see them come up here and look you all in the eyes and share their heart and cry and say, I'm so scared my family can't make it and to receive nothing in return. It's devastating. Um, as one of your employees, it's devastating to see the um, lack of regard because this does trickle down onto our clients. They absolutely know that we're understaffed. They know that we're undervalued. They know that their IHSS employees are scraping by for themselves and their own families. And they're pissed about it too. I'll tell you that. They're, our, our clients are just as mad as we are um, that we feel like we're not able to actually show up in support of them because when our mental health tanks, so does theirs, so does their care. Um, and it's just, it's devastating to see. So I really hope that you look these people in the eyes when they're talking and you hear their heart when they say, I'm struggling, I'm scared, and I need your support. Thank you. Before you speak, I'm going to see if there's any other member of the public here present would like to speak to us during public comment. If not, you'll be the last in-person speaker, and then we'll go to um, folks who are online. Good. Yeah, hello, good morning. What is it? September 24th, 2024. My name is James Ewing Whitman. Certainly some things I say should be taken as parody and not seriously. It's amazing what comes up with the amount of reading. I find myself a full-time student for the first time since 1994, taking seven units at Cabrillo. Boy, the computer interface certainly does a lot to explain what we're going towards, which is the digital ID Internet of Things or the digital idiot. It's truly frustrating not to be able to respond to stuff and how I don't even want to write things that I don't know who the hell that information is going to. So anyway, I have the seven textbooks I'm using, the one, the 238-page one about, oh, let me just quote. The title is Human Rights and Law Enforcement, a Manual on Human Rights Training for the Police by the United Nations in 1997. It's 238 pages. So I'm going to do a fair amount of reading so I can present an abstract and then turn over the tables with the absolute bullshit and control of how law enforcement has, by the own words of the first seven pages of this book, human relations and law enforcement really has no arms. You know, there is so much to comment on and so much to how they actually need help from citizens. Law enforcement's job, these officers, is much more difficult because I could clearly describe five different legal jurisdictions going on and they're just basically doing what the bankers want. And it's quite sad. I did learn in the first seven pages how the work I'm doing could be at least 125 times as effective and that was really quite gratifying. But um, anyway, it was great to see so many people talking about real issues going on in the community that unfortunately law enforcement's not addressing, but they could with more citizens' help. Thank you. All right, one more speaker. Just in person. Okay. Um, I wasn't planning on speaking. Uh, I believe we're already on. Uh, my name is Luke Dalen. I am the activities director at SLB High School in the 5th District, Bruce McPherson. <clears throat> I have some students here. You guys just raise your hands today. Um, they're all from uh, San Lorenzo Valley High School. We're trying to uh, make the first homecoming parade uh, for our school in an attempt to bring the community and our school closer together. Um, and later today, I believe you guys will, um, I didn't know there was going to be so many people speaking and it was going to take this long. So I, we got to get back to class. I got to go back to teaching. Um, but I think something will go, come before you guys and we hope that you guys take a look at it and, uh, approve it so that we can have our first ever homecoming, um, parade. So thank you guys for your time. Um, uh, <laughs> thanks. thanks. <laughs> All right. Uh, seeing no other members of the public here present would like to speak to us, um, we'll go online and hear from uh, members of the public who are online. Call in user one. Your microphone is now available. 
Marilyn Garrett muzzled truth how the California Department of Public Health rejected COVID-19 treatment and vaccine health risk warnings by Ronald F. Owens Jr., your first speaker today. Come to a presentation by this California Department of Public Health whistleblower. In his own words, describing the book, but first let me tell you this takes place Tuesday this evening at the Aptos Grange, 2555 Mar Vista Drive. That's off of Soquel Drive, 6 o'clock socializing, 6.30 program. Muzzle Truth reveals my experiences and observations before, during, and after the COVID-19 pandemic, questioning flu shot efficacy, childhood vaccine risks, and the response to COVID-19. The book highlights my efforts to inform, inform CDPH senior leadership about the potential of properly dosed ivermectin. It also exposes Secretary Javier Becerra's shocking statement on vaccine risks, revealing how CDPH management suppressed the truth. Unmuzzle the truth by reading Muzzled Truth. That's tonight at the Aptos Grange. This should be required homework reading for all of you members of the Board of Supervisors and health officials. And I am urging that you direct Santa Cruz County Health Officer Lisa Hernandez to stop promoting it administering and distributing COVID-19. Thank you, Ms. We have no further speakers, Chair. Okay. With that, I will bring it back to the board for um, comments and um, and I will pass the consent item. I'll start with Supervisor McPherson. Yep. There's uh, several issues I'd like to just address today. Uh, number uh, item number 21 regarding the American Recovery Plan Act. Uh, I'd like to thank our staff and all the community partners we've had uh, in directing and uh, utilizing the, um, the ARPA um, funds, not only to support our county workforce, but to uh, also make a key investments in our broadband. Uh, we'll hear about a little more broadband uh, network, the women and minority owned businesses and apprenticeship programs really, really important. It'll be uh, many years before we're going to really fully understand the impact of COVID uh, on our local economy and our, our health sectors in particular. But I'm glad we have uh, had this funding to offset some of the costs and uh, make some pretty critical uh, recovery investments. Um, on uh, item 25 regarding broadband and speaking of broadband, uh, thank you to Tammy Weigel, who's here. Uh, and I would like to ask her a question, if I could, this, she might come up uh, uh, for work. She's been working so diligently with uh, Santa Cruz Internet Service Providers and the Monterey Bay Economic Partnership. <clears throat> it's great to see um, the success we've had and the millions of dollars in grants to expand the broadband to those uh, households in the regions, uh, those who are particularly the ones that were underserved in the rural areas. But the, the state cutting out the middle Mile fiber was supposed to serve highways 9, 17, and 1 from Davenport to the Santa Cruz Monterey County line. Um, it's been, um, they, they haven't funded that. It's been completely short sighted. So I, I'd like to ask, um, other than the advocacy we have already done with members of the mi middle advisory, uh, the middle mile, uh, advisory committee, um, what else can we do to help promote that to get, get it, uh, in place again or in in the first place so we've had some conversations with the california department of technology which is i'm tammy weigel by the way um cio for the county of santa cruz um we've had some extended conversation with the california department of Tran uh, transport uh, excuse me technology 
Um, the issue is funding. So when the state budget was cut, um, they took a hard look at the project. Highway 9 was the last add-on um, to the project. Originally, it was just supposed to be 1 and 17. We did advocate pretty hard knowing that the, the geographic issues for getting broadband up into the Highway 9 corridor were significant. And so the state added it on what they considered phase two. Um, when the budget cuts happened, what happened was they took a look, hard look at uh, stage two, um, and most of that was cut. We are not the only county. There was approximately, out of a 10,000 mile original middle mile project, over 2,000 miles were cut um, California wide. Um, we've had a lot of discussion at my association's broadband committee on how we're trying to advocate to get some of that back. Um, we continue to advocate, but the, really what it comes down to um, Supervisor McPherson is, is the funding. Um, CDT has said that if they were to get the additional funding that they would consider putting the um, eliminated miles back. But until we see some significant funding either from the state or in a private public partnership, it's not likely that we're going to get those two um, areas that we are really hard advocating for putting back, which are the Highway 9 corridor as well as the Highway 1 corridor going from the city of Santa Cruz up to Davenport. Okay, well, yeah, and it always gets down to money, but uh, it's critically needed uh, and it's the most... Um, where the, where the places where the most need is, we're not be able to we're unable to reach. But uh, thank you for your efforts, and we'll continue to do that. I want to thank the efforts of our our uh, state representatives and federal representatives to try to make this happen too. So it's really critical, though, for uh, us addressing the next crisis that we're going to have here, and there'll be one, I'm sure. Um, on item number thirty, I want to thank uh, Chair Cummings uh, for bringing this item to the board about Proposition Four. Uh, this is a good opportunity to champion um, uh, the state level on the state level to uh, investments for investments that are locally uh, being pursued through Measure Q on this this uh, November's ballot. We know our local land uh, trust uh, of Santa Cruz County is one of the largest supporters of the statewide Proposition Four, and uh, it's likely to provide some important state funding if we can, if it passes. So I'm I'm glad that we're able to support that. On item number 38, the syringe services program. Uh, thank you to all of our health services uh, staff for its work on uh, the issue for the last several years. It's been a challenging policy matter over the years and our board has sought to support harm prevention, but also minimize overall public health and uh, safety aspects, especially neighborhoods adjacent uh, to our exchange sites. I can remove, I can support removing the fixed hours, uh, generally because I understand the service needs to be a dynamic, uh, one to meet the needs of our community. But this will be the final time as supervisor that I'll have a chance to weigh in on this issue. So I'd like to have a, uh, a, a few questions, uh, for our, uh, Monica Morales, our health services director on this. This has been discussed for many, many, uh, for several years and, uh, Couple questions, if I could, Mr. Chair. Yep. Uh, I don't want to pull it from the agenda, but I just want to. I think we can answer these quickly. Uh, do you anticipate removing the fixed hours will lead to an increase or decrease in services overall? And will that decision be based on demonstrated need or the community or staff capacity? Yeah. Good morning. Uh, for the record, Monica Morales, Health Services Agency. So there's a couple of things that are playing out right now for us, and I'll invite our public health director to also chime in and our health officer. Um, we will remain and maintain the current fixed hours. What we're trying to do is also think about uh, the need that we've seen in the community and be more flexible in terms of being able to modify based on what we're noticing um, the needs are. For example, right now we have two fixed sites. One's take place in Watsonville, another one here in Santa Cruz, Wednesdays and Thursday, and you'll see those hours in your board packet. What we're trying to do is based on the need that we hear, because there's other resources in the community that have been trimmed, um, we might have to pivot on our mobile um, services as well. So that's what it's about. Um, we don't, we see the community shifting, as you have brought up before, Supervisor McPherson, there is a, still a need for syringe there's still a need for smoking kids. We still have a very comprehensive uh, SSP model where we do a lot of referrals. We do a lot of education and all of that information is also in your board packet. 
Okay, uh, we've been seeing a, a decrease in the demand for syringes because of uh, greater, I'm afraid, uh, fentanyl and, and meta uh, phetamine uh, use as opposed to heroin. Uh, is my understanding. Um, what are we seeing now in high din- dynamic? Do you think uh, or anticipate the future decisions about ours? Um, will be based on the trends that are be- going to be coming, or how do you? gauge that that's a good question i think a lot of it has to do that it's an uncertain situation we know that we have a strong competitor of the black market who's really pushing a lot of uh, uh, different forms of use unfortunately different types of chemistries coming together what we know across the country is that you still need a diverse uh, modality like the one we have or syringes, smoking kits, other forms of education and referrals to treatment are part of the intervention. I would not say that our uh, work is done. As you've known from the data, we have high rates of overdoses in this um, county. We also see drug use still not really um, diminishing. So, you know, we believe that the work is still needed in order for us to continue to actually educate specifically our community and the youth most um, impacted by this. And I don't know, uh, Director, you guys want to speak to public health? (laughs) Sure, good morning. Um, Supervisor Cummings, Supervisor uh, McPherson and board. I'm Dr. Lisa Hernandez, health officer for the county. And I'm happy to uh, speak about syringe exchange programs. As some of you know, um, I was here back Uh, years ago when the syringe exchange program was first started here in the county. Um, What we are seeing is as Dr. Sorry, as Director Morales has mentioned, um, there's a continued need for our services. And um, while we are seeing a change in behavior and the types of drugs that are being used in our community, we know that harm reduction services help individuals not only um, use safer uh, um, equipment, but also reduce uh, substance use. 80% of individuals only touch our syringe services program in the community. That's our the only uh, services that they provide. So we are able to provide services um, in addition to um, safer uh, injecting or smoking supplies, including referrals to medicated uh, medication-assisted therapy, um, uh, healthcare, housing, uh, Narcan, fentanyl strips, and a number of other supplies. So we know that that need continues. And we know that the services uh, that that we're providing helps people be safer in the community and ultimately transition out of using drugs. It's a huge problem, but I'm glad we're addressing it. And uh, how we continue to evaluate the impacts and effectiveness of the locations of our services. Um, And do you anticipate even greater... um, a bigger move to mobile services. Good morning, Emily Chung, Public Health Division Director. In um, in terms of our locations, the need for flexibility really highlights that we're finding that we need more mobile opportunities and also to leverage existing staff that can be at fixed sites. For instance, our Watsonville fixed site hours are very limited, just a couple hours a week, and we know that we have. MAT staff who are actually on site more regularly and are willing to um, provide harm reduction and syringe service uh, services to clients on a more ad hoc basis. So having more flexibility and not being fixed at just a couple hours a week will allow us to actually provide more services. And we do anticipate having more mobile exchange as long as resources allow. Good. I think that program has worked well. And thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for letting me ask those questions. Um, uh, the one other issue that I wanted to just uh, talk about was the homelessness uh, contracts on item number 44 uh, to bring the uh, public's attention to the ongoing resources we're deploying to address this. Uh, we had a significant update on this issue from our Housing for Health office during the last board meeting. And uh, but it's worth noting the ongoing contract renewals that define our diversified investment in uh, addressing homelessness in our community. And it was it was great to be uh, witness the uh, opening or the groundbreaking of the Harvey West Commons 120 units to address the homeless problem that uh, we were engaged in. And uh, it's really a, a great project. Uh, we'll keep at it. And uh, I appreciate the time you gave me for uh, addressing some of these issues on the consent agenda. Thank you. Supervisor Hernandez. 
I just uh, two items I just want to comment on uh, 20 and 25. I had the opportunity to attend the uh, hospital district dinner and, you know, they're working 24 seven to, you know, make sure that that hospital is running. Hospital is critical to our county. And, and of course, behavioral health is also critical to our county. So I'm glad that we're doing this today. Uh, with 25, uh, I want to commend ISD staff for their work on broadband equity. And I really want to commend staff for having a uh, broadband at 500 and 150 Westridge. We, had, we literally had no cell service over there. So thank you for that. And that's it. Supervisor Conning. Thank you, Chair. Uh, on item 20, approving the amendments to the existing $2.6 million loan agreement with Pajaro Valley Healthcare District. I also wanted to thank uh, the Health Services Agency and Director Morales for helping to put this deal together. I think it's a real win-win that the county can ensure uninterrupted uh, crisis care service for our youth, and we can help move the hospital closer to actually acquiring the building that they work out of every day. On item 24, accepting and filing status report on artificial intelligence projects across county departments. I just want to appreciate all the staff who will continue uh, to be engaged on moving us forward on artificial intelligence. Uh, and I'm hopeful that tools like Elastic that are being used to make the Planning Commission agendas more accessible will ultimately be utilized for our Board of Supervisors records as well. There's a lot of material there. Um, and just want to encourage the working group and all staff to continue to identify uses that are, are really public facing and actually help members uh, of the public better utilize our core county services. Uh, I have seen some solutions out there for building plan check that provide applicants multiple rounds of feedback before uh, their submission actually reaches a, a human plan checker. And given we are short of those, um, this would be, a, I think, a valuable tool to evaluate. And uh, I'm hopeful that we can evaluate, uh, pilot tools like this and others uh, in the near future to address our critical housing shortage. On item 26, approving the appointment of Cherie Storm as the first district appointee to the first five commission. Just wanted to call this out since uh, we are going to hear from Cherie so shortly, I believe, on item 7, um, the oral health access uh, report. Um, but Cherie is a great um, just really going to be a great uh, person for this role with 17 years of experience at nonprofits like Dientes Dental Care and Second Harvest Food Bank. She has actively worked to support families with young children uh, and has collaborated with First Five Santa Cruz County on initiatives such as First Tooth, First Birthday Education Campaign, uh, which enhances dental care awareness for underserved communities. So thank you, Shree. Um, finally, just one quick note on the uh, item 38, the syringe services program uh, hybrid model status update. Uh, we really appreciate this report. It's exciting to hear that we are reaching significantly more people, 63% um, of encounters today now being through mobile services um, and a support of the direction to work with other healthcare providers besides just the HP, HP uh, street outreach team, like um, to ensure that there is that uh, coordination of service, not just um, offering addiction services, uh, but also other health services as well. Um, and I look forward to working with Salud Parla Gente uh, and others to fill gaps in South County. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll, I'll speak on a few items on item 20, which I, is just a, um, a remarkable next step in, in this transformation of Watsonville Community Hospital. I wanted to uh, thank Director Morales, also Allison Violante and my staff, and um, CEO Stephen Gray for their work on this. These discussions, including on the behavioral health side, are really only possible because this hospital is coming to public ownership. I mean, this this is just the next stage of putting over the finish line of what uh, this community and this board and our CAO have worked so hard to make sure actually happens, which is a, a sustainable and, and safe and forward thinking um, hospital system in South County. It really was on the precipice. It's really flipped the other way and it's moving towards sustainability. And it's, it's um, I think it's a statewide model of, of collaboration and success. And I appreciate the work that everybody's done on it. On item um, in regards to uh, broadband and equity on item 25, um, I know that Tammy, I know that you're working so hard on this and, and we don't have all the pieces uh, being given to us by the state federal players, in particular the state players on this. Uh, we did a lot of advocacy, Supervisor McPherson, at the state and federal level to make this money happen in the first place, and then additional advocacy of the CPUC and others to try and broaden the definition of where this money could be. Um, that advocacy actually hasn't stopped, by the way, and and uh, something that I'm continuing to do. But I think that 
What's unfortunate here is, is I actually don't think this is a money issue. I think this is a policy decision issue, which is to say the money is available. The way the state's interpreting it doesn't really advantage our community. And uh, we have a community that's that's expecting this funding to come down to broaden Internet access. And it's, we've been shown with just the small amount of ARPA money that we use that a small investments can go a long way in, in lighting up communities, in particular rural communities in our area. But I think uh, in both third district and fifth district and some of the upper reaches in, in my district and Supervisor uh, Koenig's district and in some of the, the rural areas, uh, this funding was supposed to change the trajectory of that. And right now, under the current construct and CPUC regulations, it won't. So I think that we need to keep fighting to make sure that they broaden that definition so that we can do that. This is, I understand the state is claiming it's a money issue, but it's not a money issue. I mean, it really, there was, this is the largest investment that the federal government has ever made in history in broadband access. And right now it's not being defined broadly enough that we can actually use it within our community for the services we need. That's not for lack of work from our remarkable ISD director. She has just been an absolute force in both uh, being on the doors of elected officials across the state as well as in regional components. So I appreciate all that you've done on that. Um, I would like to second the work, the comments that Director, excuse me, that Supervisor Koenig made on the artificial intelligence projects. Um, as we, as you all know, this is something that I brought forward to the board, and these are pretty exciting pilot projects. I mean, they might sound like they're um, sort of behind the scenes, but I mean, to have all this information translated on one end, which is one of the pilot projects, to have uh, direct community access to planning commission information on the other. Um, some of the additional programs that are being reviewed are exactly what direct, uh, what Supervisor Koenig had mentioned, which is in regards to the planning department looking at ways that we can simplify the processes through AI. I appreciate that this has been a slow and thoughtful process because there's a real security question that's always about the implementation of new programs. That's very important. These Some of these are new companies um, that you also need to make sure that they meet our vetting process. With that said, this is the way the world's going, and we should uh, try and embrace it to the way that we can to make it as public facing as possible. I'm, I'm very encouraged by uh, some of the results of this and, and look forward to whatever the next board does and in, in expanding some of the AI capabilities to the community. The last thing I'll say is on item 48, um, which is an agreement um, with County Park Friends for the Pinto Lake Skate Park. This is um, as somebody who uh, has literally only skated once, I, you'll appreciate this, Chair Combs. I was literally, I've only skated once in my life and I ended up in the ER as a result of it. Um, it's been even surprising to me that I've, uh, this has been something that I've pushed so much for uh, in our community to have expansion. But uh, growing up in San Diego, don't laugh at me, Dr. Dr. Hernandez. I mean, it just, it was, it, I mean, I really bit it. I still have a scar right here on my chin. It is what it is. But we've had an expansion of uh, skate parks throughout our county in the last few years because of these, these public-private partnerships. This is an expansion of it. Um, this was an ongoing conversation where um, I really wanted something in, in Watsonville. We wanted something in South County. Uh, I know that there's something at Ramsey, but we wanted something on the county side. And this will finally bring it to fruition. I just wanted to thank NHS for their continued partnership on this. I mean, it's a world-class agency centered right here in our community. They're expanding opportunities for outdoor fitness and options for kids to skate in our community. Uh, County Park Friends has just been amazing as a nonprofit leader and, and uh, both Jeff and Rebecca on the team there, you guys, I mean, just fighting to make sure that these options are provided. So this is just an item buried on consent, but it's going to be a future skate park very soon, actually, for uh, so many youth in, in South County. So thank you for that legacy work that you're providing on that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, um, I'll try to be brief. Item number 20, just wanna um, thank um, HSA for all their hard work on this and for bringing this forward today. It's the least we can do to help get the transfer of the hospital um, you know, across the finish line. So really grateful to be able to support that. Um, item number 30 um, related to Prop 4, I uh, just want to thank Rachel Dan for bringing this to, our, to my attention and for being able to put this on the agenda for the board support. As we're being impacted by climate change, we're going to need all the resources possible to be able to help support our community. And, and these funds, uh, $10 billion, um, if it passes, will go a long way for the entire state of California. So I'm glad we could get our community and our board to support that item as well. Um, item number 38, um, this is on the student service program. Um, just want to thank staff for their hard work on this and for bringing it, being able to bring forward the mobile um, um, student services program. I did want to ask, I know that there was a request to change the name and was just curious if that's something that the board needs to take action on or is that something that um, staff will 
ultimately end up doing uh, just so that it's, you know, when we provide a direction today that um, it's clear. Yeah, so from our understanding, it's a program level uh, decision. We did actually uh, request and seek a lot of community input, including client input. Uh, SSP for a lot of people doesn't seem to resonate with the comprehensive approach that the program has. So at this point, um, that's kind of where it stands. Uh, I definitely welcome ideas and thoughts on the proposed names from the board and see if you have any other suggestions. We'll gladly take your, your approach. Well, I'll just I'll just say that I I think the name change is um, fitting and it, you know really reflects harm reduction, which is which is ultimately what this program is trying to, to get towards. Uh, and so, um, just want to express my support of that. If that's you know where um, the the name change is heading. Um, and then also, I know that there were some um, uh, concerns brought up around vehicle access, and so. Um, I'm wondering if you all have any thoughts on that. I mean, we're going to have a, a, another conversation later about budget, our budget and Measure K, but, you know, it seems like um, if we're trying to be flexible with the mobile programs, um, being able to have access to vehicles is going to be really important for that to happen. Yeah, I appreciate your acknowledgement of that and the um, the concerns our staff have raised about having vehicle access. We're working uh, with the GST uh, program, vehicle program that they have instituted recently, which includes um, new leasing options as well as new pooled vehicle options. What we need to try to accommodate, though, is that we have locations for services in South County and North County. So logistically, we're just trying to find the most e efficacious and price um uh, price reasonable way to do it, knowing that we need a vehicle access in South County and North, not wanting to lease two vehicles necessarily, but also knowing that currently the GSD vehicle leasing program doesn't have any South County vehicles yet. And so we want to try to see if there's any options there. Um, we think that will be the most um, effective way to move forward instead of purchasing anything. Great. Uh, we'll keep us posted on how we can help support that. Appreciate and um, um, item numbers, um, 42 and 44, this is related to um, funding for um, programs that support our in house population. I just want to thank um, HSD and our health services agency for all their ongoing continued work to help us um, provide services for people experiencing homelessness so we can ultimately try to get them on a better path and, and out of homelessness. Um, item number 48, I was really excited to see this one as somebody who used to skate and, and uh, it's always great seeing skate parks pop up in our community. And so um, just glad to see that we'll have another skate park here locally and, and you know, hope to continue to embrace and support local skate culture here in Santa Cruz. Um, and then finally, um, item number 54, it was great to have the folks from San Lorenzo Valley High School here today to join us and get a little taste of what it's like to, to go to a board meeting. And so really excited to be able to support um, the uh, homecoming parade uh, for the San, for San Lorenzo Valley High. And with that, um, I'll end my comments there. And if there's no other comments from board members, I'd like to see if someone will be willing to move the consent agenda. I'll move consent to the agenda. I'll second. All right, so we have a motion by Supervisor Hernandez, seconded by Supervisor Friend. I'll turn it to the clerk for a roll call vote. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Friend? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously. Um, okay, so that ends our consent agenda. Um, why don't we, well, yeah, let's move on to our regular agenda. So the first item on our regular agenda is a presentation, Oral Health Access Santa Cruz County 2024-2028 Strategic Plan by co-chairs of the OHA Coalition, Cherie Storm, Chief Strategy Officer at the Enthus Community Dental, and David Brody, Executive Director of First Five. And so I'll turn it over to you all for the presentation. Good morning. Okay. So as we were introduced, I'm Sherry Storm. I am the Chief Strategy Officer for Deontes Community Dental Care. And today I'm here with uh, David Brody, who's the Executive Director of First Five. Together, we are the co-chairs for Oral Health Access. First, I want to thank the board for all of your support for oral health, especially Supervisor Zach Friend. 
as our past co-chair together with him, uh, together with Dr. Seppi Tagbe, you have really achieved great things. Uh, we're here today to talk about our new strategic plan uh, for Santa Cruz County. Next slide. Oh, I do. Oh, look at that. Great. Um, again, uh, thank you for having us today, David Brody. I'm the executive director of First Five Santa Cruz County, but of course, uh, today sit here as the co-chair of the Oral Health Access Initiative. And just a little point of privilege, want to thank uh, Supervisor Koenig again for the appointment that came up on consent. I've, I've worked with Sherry now for a number of years in this county, and uh, her and the work of DNTs is truly just an outstanding exemplar of the best that you can be for, uh, for families and young children in our community. And it's an honor to be here working with her again today. So thank you. Um, as many of you know, access to oral health care, uh, in particular for our low income population, has been a long standing uh, issue in our county. Uh, and it's one that we would, we've determined to change uh, really over the past eight years. Um, our journey to expand access started in 2015 with some of you here in this room with the completion of the first ever oral health needs assessment in the county. Um, the need that was identified uh, was so large by Dientes at that time that they brought together a group of some 16 partners uh, under the premise that I love that you don't have to be a dentist to impact the oral health care of your community. Um, and from there, the Oral Health Access uh, Initiative was born, led by our first co-chairs, as we've already heard, Dr. Sepi Tagbayi, and of course, our, our friend, County Supervisor Zach Friend. Uh, and of course, just this past April, uh, we shared our new strategic plan at our Oral Health Summit. Uh, and here, oh, thanks. Uh, here you can see our current OHA members, including many of the health and human services organizations, including your own county departments um, that we work with and you work with every day. Our new strategic plan was informed by an updated needs assessment that was conducted in 2022. That had a key finding that those who are ages three to five have the highest rate of going to the dentist of any other age group. And then it roller coaster drops to 18% by age 21 and essentially stays low for the rest of life. A major focus of this new plan is how to affect this curve. Centered around a focus on increasing access to care, our new strategic plan has four categories, expanding access, expanding capacity, collaborating with schools, focusing on seniors, and medical dental integration. Expanding prevention, treatment, and clinical capacity is goal one and core to our new plan. Our combined goal at Dientes and Salud is to increase capacity of our clinics by 21% by 2028. Both organizations are going to continue to ramp up um, from COVID, hire staff, and grow our mobile dental programs. Lastly, we'll focus on an increase in access to care for the special populations that are identified in this plan. Goal two of our plan leverages the existing relationships that we have with schools uh, and have and with families to continue to connect children with a dental home. Goal two includes two areas of focus. First, kindergarten oral health. Uh, this work is fundamentally about ensuring that children have a dental home when they enter school. We've been working on this for the past eight years, and we've seen some great success, a 79% increase in the number of children on Medi-Cal ages three to nine who now have a dental home in our county. And of course, we want to continue that success. We want to do that by providing training and education to school staff, by educating families through kindergarten enrollment packets, and by continuing the link to, uh, to children to a, by continuing to link children to a dental home through Salud and Dientes, as Sherry described. Um, the second part of goal two supports teen oral health uh, to address the steep decline that we've seen in older children visiting the dentist that Sherry sh um, talked about a moment ago. Uh, as a new goal, our intent here is to increase the percentage of young people who regularly attend the dentist uh, to 60%. As preteens and teens become, you know, maybe a little less enthusiastic about listening to their parents, something I know a little bit about, we believe success will be found in engaging them both as active decision makers, which is critically important in their oral health uh, and their oral health habits, but also, and we're really excited about this, and your public health unit has done some great work here into the design of a peer education campaign. Next up, another population that has seen a low rate of going to the dentist, seniors. This is important because 
Uh, no one is getting younger. In fact, at Santa Cruz County Master Plan on Aging, they're estimating one in three people living in Santa Cruz are going to be over the age of 60 by 2030. Just six years, just six years away, although it's well, closer to five at this point. We're fortunate that last year, Delta Dental awarded Dientes and Salud a $5 million five-year grant, the second in the country to support our senior oral health partnership. And this is a great feather in our community's cap. We aim to increase the rate of seniors with Medi-Cal going to the dentist from 27% to 40% through a range of activities, including mobile dentistry, an oral health education campaign, and focused advocacy for dental to be a core part of Medicare, not instead of just an add-on. Moving on to our fourth goal, medical dental integration. Um, this goal has four areas of focus. First, to increase the percentage of pregnant people in our county going to the dentist. Here, we're concentrating on educating Medi-Cal members and providers on promoting oral health through the home visiting programs in our county, ones that we work really closely with all of you on, and on implementing a robust referral program to support patient access. Second, to continue our highly successful first tooth, first birthday education campaign, which of course, at first five, we are extremely proud of, which has been integrated in our Baby Gateway program, a program that you all are familiar with that sees and serves and supports over 2,000 newborns and families each year in all three of our birthing hospitals. And of course, coordinating with Ventures Semiitis College Savings Account Program, which has also integrated oral health goals into that fantastic program. Third, to increase fluoride varnish applications in well-child medical visits for children ages zero to five. And these applications are particularly important due to the lack of fluoridated water in our county, as you know. And fourth and last, but certainly not least, we wanna focus on the needs of diabetic patients by increasing mobile dentistry visits and launching an education campaign. So with that, our brief presentation, we'd like to thank you very much for having us here today. Um, all of this information is, of course, available on our website, oralhealthscc.org, and we encourage you to uh, visit the site, encourage your constituents to visit the site, and to engage our campaign to support and promote oral health in Santa Cruz County. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much for the I have one thing I want to add, and uh, this prog program could not be possible without the enormous efforts of Monica Nichols, who works for um, HSA. And so I just want to make sure that you are aware that we are very closely tied with the health, County Health Services. Great. Well, thank you so much for all of your work on this and for being here to, to help inform the board and our community about all the efforts that you all are going through to help increase and improve oral health in our community. Um, before we, I um, open it up for questions and comments from the board, I'm going to see if there's any members of the public who like to speak to us on this item. This is an informational item, so we won't be taking action, but we do invite folks up who would like to make comments. Yeah, still good morning. My name is James Ewing Whitman. It's absolutely great that the three leading uh, medical misinformation experts are here in the room. Now to deal with the dental, I was hoping that there was going to be some kind of trigger mechanism to cause a logical conversation. So one of the previous pictures, increased fluoride varnish applications. You know, before 1937, fluoride's primary use was as rat poison when it's ingested into the body or absorbed through the skin, it dulls the senses of the human body and spirit. So it takes 240,000 gallons to make one pound of fluoride inert. We're putting 50 pound containers into our water system. That's 12 million gallons to disperse that so it's not as toxic, you know, when you read the fluoride toothpaste, it says you're supposed to take like a pea-sized amount, but if you swallow that, you're supposed to call poison control with the amount of fluoride that's in some jurisdictions' waters. You'd be having to call, to call poison control for every eight ounce glass of fluoride that you drink. People really need to educate themselves as to what's going on. I mean, I could read the short. You know, from Brock Chisholm, who in 1946 disseminated basically the secret covenant stuff. 
why the Illuminati started, what the Jesuits were doing to try to control the populations, to this grand year of 2024 of such change. To achieve world government, it is necessary to remove from the minds of men their individuality, their loyalty to family traditions, and their national identity. If the senses are dulled by such a simple toxic poison as fluoride, look around us at what's going on. Enough for now. Thank you. Hello again, Emily Chung, Public Health Division Director. I just wanted to take this moment to thank all of our Oral Health Access Committee members and Sheree and David for being here today, specifically to present this wonderful information and the great work that our community is leading around oral health. Our Public Health Division, as Sheree mentioned, is a backbone for the Oral Health Access Committee, and we are very proud of this work as part of our um, program's local our oral health program in our division. And Monica is a real stalwart, stalwart for that program. So we encourage you, um, members of the public and the Board of um, board of Supervisors to continue supporting this work, as well as to look at our oral health access data on datashareSCC.org for more information about our progress as we continue this fantastic body of work. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. Good morning, Becky Steinbruner, resident of the 2nd District. I oppose uh, fluoridation in, uh, in drinking water, certainly, and that was uh, shot down robustly by residents of Watsonville a number of years ago. And I protest that it is a common thing to do with youth. As the first speaker pointed out, there are many studies that have been shown there are detriments of fluoridation in brain development and cognitive development of youth especially. If this policy continues, I feel there should be uh, balanced information provided to the, the parents of the children that there are dangers, there is harm and let them decide whether or not they want to accept that risk. Thank you. All right, let's see no other members of the public here in person. I'd like to see if there's any members of the public online who would like to speak to us on this item. Yes, Chair, we have speakers. Call in user one, your microphone is now available. Marilyn Garrett. What the two speakers have just referred to is well documented, the harm of fluoride. There's a book called The Fluoride Deception. And um, problems with dentistry, a lot of toxic materials, including x-rays, which always carry harm, including a link to brain cancer. Uh, do you know the name Edward Bernays? Edward Bernays is in this, related to this. He was known as the father of propaganda. He was a nephew of Sigmund Freud. And using the psychology of his uncle, he was hired by the tobacco industry, also the fluoride industry, to get women to smoke in the 1920s by careful manipulation and lies. The industry manages perception to motivate behavior to create business results. So he was able to turn the perception of fluoride, which is a rat poison, and is a waste product from the aluminum phosphate fertilizer and uranium industries to make it look like it was beneficial. It isn't. We need holistic dentistry. We don't need toxic materials like fluoride included. And the courageous work, I want to appreciate the residents of Watsonville who were instrumental in uh, defeating fluoridation in the water. Uh, Nick Thank you, Ms. Garrett. 
We have no further speakers, Chair. Okay, I'll bring it back to the board to see if there's any comments from board members. Supervisor Bonnie. Yeah, well, thank you so much for your work uh, on this, both of you, David and Sherry. Um, you know, it seems like there's just increasing awareness in our society in general of the importance of oral health determining our overall health and well-being. Um, and so this is an incredibly important topic for, for health in our community in general. I mean, and these numbers are really impressive, uh, 30 um, or 225% increase in, in children going to the dentist by their first birthday. Um, that's awesome. Um, and then the 39% increase in clinical capacity, also I think really a testament to uh, collaboration throughout our community to just increase those facilities. Um, I mean, definitely access, I think, determines utilization. And I think the plan is good in that you're focusing on the two populations, uh, people who are you know, the teenagers and seniors who we know most likely have that medical coverage to provide access and just aren't taking advantage of it. Um, and so that's where you know, we have the most control and I think can see the best results. So uh, plan seems great that way. Uh, just one question, which is, um, have you seen any um, direct correlation even with the opening of the uh, dentist clinic in Live Oak? I mean, it's such a beautiful facility, so centrally located. I gotta, gotta believe that more people are like, you know, I think I will go to the dentist because I just wanna go uh, hang out in that beautiful location. Yes, thank you. And thank you so much for the county's support of our uh, new clinic at 1500 Capitola Road. Um, we are seeing 5,000 patients a year at that clinic. So things are going very well there. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Well, I'll just briefly say that uh, this, the collective group of folks that came together in this um, six or so, eight years ago, um, I can say unequivocally, made a larger difference on the issues that they were trying to tackle than any other group I've been with as an elected official in these 12 years, which is to say that there was a mission, there was a problem, there was a massive underutilization, there was there was an information problem, there was a need from local hospitals and clinics and dentists and doctors and education sources to bring everybody together. Um, and it worked. I mean, the numbers, the, the the growth and impact of the number of, of young people in particular that are accessing um, oral health care in our community went up exponentially. And it wouldn't have happened. I mean, none of this would have happened before the work of this organ of this collective group of people. And I found that to be a very powerful um, sign of what's possible when, when people really come together over a collective problem. So um, thank you for the work that you've done. I mean, there's there's people whose lives are going to be fundamentally different as a result of the work that was done by the group, and it's going to continue to get better. I appreciate it. Supervisor McPherson? Yeah, I just wanted to say this is makes you smile, and I think a lot more kids and seniors uh, feel more comfortable smiling today than they would have been eight or ten years ago. But first of all, the, what you did, the targets that you had, the collaboration with schools, was impressive and you made that and then you said hey we've got uh the opposite end of the age spectrum uh with seniors and to address those issues uh people that probably weren't thinking about it or wouldn't have done it without your input um i just want to thank or say congratulations on that uh great grant that you got one of five in the nation i mean that speaks to what you have done uh and i i can't let this go without just uh complimenting my colleague Zach Friend on this. He has been steadfast in making this a reality and making it effective and ongoing and expanding. Uh, it's really a tremendous program as the uh, as the board representative of the first five, uh, which does so many great things. This is one of the best of them, and this collaborative effort is just paying off huge dividends that will be appreciated by these people for the rest of their lives and the end of their lives, whatever spectrum you want to go to. But uh, really, congratulations to you and everybody involved. That's Reverend Endes. Thank you. I'd like to thank staff as well. Uh, oral, all the oral health access to the Entis program for all the work that you guys accomplished. And I'd like to thank also my colleague, supervisor, friend for his leadership in this role as well. You know, uh, dental health is important in our community. Um, it's, you know, studies are showing that oral health is linked to uh, less cancer rates. So it's really important in our community. So thank you again for all the work that you guys have done. Well, Cheryl, then, um, 
comments that were expressed by my colleagues and also want to express my appreciation for the work that Supervisor Friend has done on this effort and just want to thank you all for your commitment to really ensuring that um, people have healthy, beautiful smiles in our community because there's a lot to smile about here in Santa Cruz and we want people to feel comfortable being able to do that. Um, and then, you know, if there's any um, opportunity for us to help share out information, please continue to keep us informed so that we can help um, promote uh, your work through our newsletters and really, you know, get people to understand what type of oral care uh, access is out there because I do think that there's some folks who maybe, um, you know, don't have health insurance, but they don't know what is available. And so being able to connect younger people with those kinds of resources will really help to promote more people going and taking advantage of the programs that we have here in the county and being able to, you know, go to the dentist more frequently. So they're not just picking up when they're older and trying to, you know, make up for, for missed visits to the, to the dentist. So, so thank you all again. And, um, and with that, uh, this is, since this was a presentation, uh, if there's no further comments, comments, um, we'll just um, accept the presentation and then we'll move on to our next item. So thank you all again for being here. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. All right. So the next item on our agenda is item number eight. Uh, consider approving the county fire master plan and take related actions. And so I'll turn it over to uh, Michael Beaton from GSD and uh, our county fire chief. I'm going to go to bed. Uh, thank you, Chair uh, and Board. Uh, Michael Beaton, I'm the Director of General Services for the County of Santa Cruz and the County Fire Contract Administrator. Uh, presenting with me today is the Cal Fire San Mateo Santa Cruz Unit Chief and your County Fire Chief, Jed Wilson. Uh, today we're going to be going over the County Fire Master Plan uh, and the recommendation for the Board to uh, adopt the Master Plan. In early 2023, the County Fire Department undertook the effort to develop a County Fire Master Plan as a way to improve the County Fire Protection. Um, the last County Fire Master Plan was completed in 2012, and it lacked a lot of the significant details uh, related to the operations of the County Fire Department. Through the recommendation of the County Fire Department Advisory Commission, uh, we contracted with a company called AP Triton, uh, who is a... Um, renowned expert in developing county fire master plans. Uh, AP Triton has done master plans for county fire departments up and down the state, including Solano County, including our own central fire, uh, central fire department uh, here within Santa Cruz County, uh, including uh, Exeter, uh, including Salinas, uh, City of Salinas Fire Department, uh, just to name a few for AP Triton. Uh, and we apologize that we're not able to make this uh, meeting today to uh, answer any questions regarding the actual detailed report due to a scheduling conflict. Uh, through AP Triton's work, as part of the assessment, was conducted through uh, stakeholder interviews consisting of community leaders, citizens, chief officers, labor leaders, volunteer firefighters, rank and file fire personnel, and administrative staff. The report also does a deep analysis of the operations of County Fire and the environment in which it operates out of. To go over the report a little bit more into detail, I'm going to toss it over to Chief Wilson to give a little more specifics. Thank you, Director Beaton. Uh, Director Cummings and Board of Supervisors, thank you for this opportunity to present the master plan. Um, I'm going to go over a high level of what the 272-page document has within it. If you do like some light reading, I suggest uh, as you get towards the back, there's uh, a lot of data in there and it's a, a lot of good information. So the master plan, um, 272 pages and there's five main sections. I'll kind of break each one of those down and do think that when this goes through county fire, this includes CSA 48 and CSA 4 Pajaro Dune. So it's all encompassing of both of those CSAs combined when you're looking at fiscal figures, response data, et cetera, it's combined, it's not separated out. Um, section one, we're gonna go over evaluation of the current conditions, what your county fire department looks as like today. Uh, support programs that we offer and maybe what we should offer. Uh, oh yeah, sorry, there we go. 
uh, community risk assessment, finding and recommendations, and the appendices. So in section one, there's an overview of your fire department, um, the structure of your department is, uh, the management components of your department, and the staffing and personnel of the agency. In the continuation of that section, um, there's the fiscal overview, capital facilities and apparatus, and the service delivery and performance. Um, it goes into detail on the properties, ownership of said properties, um, and equipment that has been donated to the department who has ownership. Those are some things that always seem to come in question with County Fire, who actually owns the building, and how long is the lease, et cetera. This report does a good job detailing that. Uh, support programs, analysis of the volunteer program, where our volunteer program is, where it can go, and is it beneficial? The type of medical services we provide as county fire, what level of service? Uh, we talk about public education in there, uh, training and continued medical education, uh, what we're training our folks, what standards we're meeting, and are we in compliance? Hazardous materials support, and then special operations are also covered. The community risk assessment section uh, goes over uh, the county as a whole, talks about the population and demographics of the county and uh, the risk that we have with those populations and demographics and the land use within the county. Uh, talks about critical infrastructure again of, uh, for response and the fire risk for our communities. Uh, there's a section on finding the recommendations and this is where we're gonna get down to uh, in the later portion of this presentation, Director Beaton and I will go over all of the short-term, medium-term, and long-term uh, recommendations based on their findings and observations. The appendices uh, covers uh, strategic partners and stakeholder interviews. Those are detailed. There's no names, but as, as you read them, you can see the flavor of the answers. Um, there's the risk classification, there's tables and figures, and there's uh, references, which again, that light reading, there's a lot of data there for you to review. So I'm gonna turn it over to Director Beaton. Uh, thank you, Chief. Uh, so as you can imagine, this report is a rather large report. Uh, it took AP Triton quite some time to actually do the analysis, the number crunching, the review of all the data, the response times, the interview of the stakeholders, to kind of come up with some uh, findings and recommendations. The next two slides that I'm gonna be covering are just some of the high level findings that were identified by AP Triton. The first one right off the back is the County Fire Department does not have a strategic plan. Uh, it just doesn't have one. Uh, the first part of developing a strategic plan is really to have a master plan. And then from there, we're gonna start working on, uh, and now with the adoption, hopefully of this master plan being presented today, we'll start working on development of a strategic plan for our County Fire Department. Some of the other uh, interesting findings that were popped up in the report is that the number of firefighter personnel that we have, both volunteer and paid firefighters, are actually less than the national average. And when you look at the numbers that we have on duty, they're actually significantly less than the national averages. It also identified that our uh, one third of our volunteers that we currently have, uh, at least at the time of this report, just do not respond to emergency calls. So that's an indication that we have a little bit of an issue with our uh, volunteer uh, response uh, and reliability throughout our department. The Santa Cruz Fire Department turnover for volunteers is anywhere from 7% to 35%. So that basically means we lose almost a third of our firefighters, volunteers, uh, you know, on not on average, but uh, over the sample period of a five-year period, uh, one year we lost about a third of our fire department uh, volunteers. Uh, to really help out. We also looked at the turnout performance for our volunteers, it took about 14 minutes. So by the time we get a phone call uh, to have a firefighter apparatus uh, ready to uh, roll, it's taken about 14 minutes. Uh, when you compare that to the NFPA standard, which is the National Fire Protection Association, Association uh, standards, uh, it exceeds and it's actually at the 90 percentile. To go over a couple other findings that were interesting, um, 
there were some significant data uh, issues. So when AP Triton started to look at the data, uh, both collected internally, uh, as well as data from our uh, dispatch uh, up at Felton, uh, a lot of the data was missing pertinent information to actually do a full detailed analysis. So it identified that we had some quality issues uh, in related to, uh, to do a good solid analysis about the performance of our fire department. They also identified it was very hard to disseminate uh, what was CAL FIRE's um, time or um, responses versus what was county fire. Uh, as it is a cooperative agreement, the blending between county fire and uh, CAL FIRE uh, was blended. Another uh, two other interesting findings were that 7% of all county fire calls happen between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. And this will be uh, important as we go through some of the recommendations that they came up with. Uh, so when you think about 70% of all the calls that we have in county fire happen between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. The last finding is what I consider the most significant finding. Uh, and this one here is during the peak fire season, when we are at our most vulnerable time in our county, we actually have less on average firefighters than we do during non-peak firefighting uh, period. And so there is a recommendation from AP Triton uh, that we're supporting um, to explore uh, coming up in the next two slides. So, <clears throat> So before we get started through the 17 recommendations that were identified in the County Fire Master Plan report, uh, there is a recommendation that we scratched out, which is a A2, uh, contract with Cal Fire for one Schedule A Deputy Chief. Uh, this recommendation was not supported by our Fire Department Advisory Commission, uh, your County Fire Chief, or the um, uh, Department of General Services Contract Administrator. Uh, so for this report, we are recommending that it get removed, uh, and it's uh, lined out through the uh, master plan report and on the presentation here. So going through the short-term recommendations, um, one was that we need to work on emphasizing our quality assurance, you know, identifying that they weren't able to actually do a good performance analysis based on our data inputs. Uh, we needed to increase a CAL FIRE division chief to help implement a lot of the recommendations that are actually coming out of this master plan. Uh, they identified that we did not have administrative support uh, through our CAL FIRE contract. Uh, so an addition of a div division chief uh, would be recommended. In addition, that we needed to develop a incident data uh, review on an annual basis to do performance and process improvement for our county fire department. We need to complete a three to five year strategic plan identified in A5, and we need to figure out how do we improve our volunteer company uh, activity, uh, both through data collection and response. So jumping back to uh, uh, one of the findings that were identified uh, related to we have less firefighters on uh, on during peak fire season versus non-peak fire season, uh, AP Triton really went through and identified, we need to figure out a way or mechanism that we can actually improve our staffing levels during that time frame. They identified potentially three different options on how we can actually increase our uh, firefighters during the fire peak season by potentially staffing uh, three fire stations 24 seven, 365 days a year versus our current contracting relationship, which is uh, advantageous where we only fund the firefighters during the non-peak fire season. Uh, A7 really identifies uh, looking at a potential increase in the agreement with CAL FIRE to make sure that the firefighters stay within our county uh, if there is a state fire. Uh, also identifies potentially looking at uh, increasing our participation of our volunteer firefighters uh, throughout our county. And the third option that identified in the report is a combination of the three. It also identifies that we need to set and adopt performance standards and goals uh, for our county fire department. Uh, A9 identified, as uh, Chief Wilson identified earlier, uh, the report does look at both the fiscal relationship of CSA 48 and CSA 4. The report identified a very significant deficiency in the funding uh, for CSA 4, and it was recommending that we do a uh, some sort of a special assessment to generate revenue for CSA 4. Uh, due to the length from the time this report was created, uh, the county uh, CSA 4 had ar has already adopted a special benefit, assist special benefit assessment. Uh, so A9 has uh, been resolved uh, as far as the report is concerned. Um, it also includes a volunteer satisfaction survey, uh, develop a public information campaign, and to really look at our fire department advisory commission uh, as part of A12. And we have a recommendation uh, coming up here 
So, all right, our, our midterm uh, recommendations that were provided was establish a program for staffing stations during peak demand hours. And one of the things that we've already started looking at is uh, existing within the state of California and other counties where they've had a, a benefit of having volunteers have shifts um, to hopefully increase the available uh, workforce during that. So we're doing a cost benefit on that. Uh, develop a risk-based uh, public education program for the department-wide delivery. Um, since the implementation three years ago of funding a battalion chief for county fire, that battalion chief, myself originally, and Chief Filson now, have uh, really done an instrumental job in reaching out to the community and participating in events within the community. Um, our social media for, uh, I'll use Coralitas as an example for Company 41 out there, they are going to events left and right, trying to do as much as they can in the community, which has actually increased our applications for volunteers. This, we, we actually, while we were sitting here, we got one, someone applying, because um, we opened that up year round instead of a short time frame. So we're, we're working towards those that uh, B2. Applying for a safer grant to hire a volunteer recruitment and retention coordinator. Um, we're examining the true benefit of what a retention and recruitment coordinator could bring to us and the safer grant dollars to see if it would actually be a fiscal um, benefit to someone to take on that responsibility. Um, and we also are looking at possibly if that would be better served as maybe a department PIO position where we could have more outreach in someone that would be dedicated to that. Long-term recommendations, uh, reevaluate re station locations and effectiveness uh, following staffing improvements and new uh, response data. Uh, this would, would be conducted well before C2, so we could do a standards of coverage and get factual data so we could make dr data-driven decisions and not just off-the-cuff decisions. That would move us into C2 to create a comprehensive capital improvement plan, which County Fire does not have, and allow us to look into the future and not kind of go at it blindly. So are our stations in the proper location? Uh, do we own the station that we're in, or are we leasing it? And should we buy property and move so that county fire could uh, provide the citizens the service that they deserve? So this is what we're underway with. So A1, A4, and A6, data improvements. Um, we have implemented a record management system called First Due, which will allow us to inventory track all of our equipment. It allows for volunteers to um, notify when they're responding in their personal vehicle, in their car, and it's all tracked and collected data, which currently we have been historically using Google Sheets to do that. So we're moving into the 21st century um, with our record management system. We also uh, last year started working with Lexipol to develop a policy and procedure manual that's not just a handbook, so that we're meeting all federal and state uh, and county guidelines for that. So that will be uh, released in the next probably six months. We've uh, gone through the first review. Um, A3, division chief being added uh, for fiscal year 24-25. We have submitted the contract for approval and we're waiting for the position coding to fly that position and we will hire a division chief for county fire and that individual will be able to uh, make sure that we implement the strategic plan development lead in all of these recommendations and uh, help with that county policy and procedure manual. A9, as Director Be Beaton mentioned, CSA4 uh, special benefit assessment has been passed. So we've already accomplished that one of those first 12. A12 converting uh, FDAC to a department advisory group, um, revising county code. Last Wednesday was the FDAC's last uh, meeting they dissolved and we are now working towards creating uh, what the DAG will look like as we move forward for County Fire. So Director Beaton and myself, along with some of the FDAC members, previous FDAC members, um, are going to come up with that. So just to jump on a little bit more about the Fire Department Advisory Commission, um, I've had the luxury of working with the Fire Department Advisory Commission since my time as director here over the last six years. Uh, and uh, they have been a, a great commission um, and great group of individuals that represent the community. So I'm uh, uh, very thankful uh, for their support. Uh, and I know at the last FDAC meeting, uh, 
each one of the FTAC members were given a congratulatory plaque for their service uh, to our community uh, on behalf of uh, CAL FIRE. So uh, very thankful for that. Uh, the Fire Department Advisor Commission has reviewed this County Fire Master Plan. Uh, they did recommend uh, to support all the recommendations with the exception of A2 uh, as previously identified. Uh, they did recommend at one of the board meetings that we do convert the Fire Department Advisor Commission to, the, to a departmental advisor group, which is already underway. And I think technically at the end of this month that is when they actually dissolve. Uh, and to explore converting county fire into an independent fire district. So kind of embedded throughout the county fire master plan was this uh, governance structure uh, and uh, the role of FDAC uh, and the role of how county fire is situated within our county. Uh, through the last fire department advisory commission or one of the last ones, uh, they were actually recommended that we should be exploring, uh, as part of uh, potentially converting county fire, uh, from a county operated department into a independent fire district. Um, this also coincides with the, uh, LAFCO, uh, special, um, fire study that was completed. Um, and in concert with that, um, we come up with our recommendations. Oops. Uh, which is to adopt the county fire master plan as uh, presented here today and direct the director of general services uh, to work with the local agency formation commission to explore the feasibility of converting county fire to an independent fire district. With that, we are available for any questions the board may have. Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, we'll open up to the public first to see if there's any members of the public who would like to speak to us on this item. So please come forward. You'll have two minutes. Yeah, good morning still. My name is James Ewing Whitman. How about a, some lighter comments than usual? Um, I was reminded of some conversations I had with the uh, fire chief in Santa Cruz that there's several patents for sound equipment that puts out fires. Since that conversation with him, I have refound three video presentations of sound equipment that puts out fires from like a distance from an airplane. So the technology is there and it's really quite simple. I could go into some detail on how to do that. So I was curious, I'm glad that it was mentioned. This, is, this was 272, 73 pages on page 37. It was said, I was curious what the stakeholders were. I couldn't find it in the binder. Found it in the information. It wasn't really the definition of stakeholders that I was looking for. Um, I appreciate this presentation. It, it kind of sucks that uh, enrollment is low and more people are needed. It seems like there's so many areas where people physically need to be present and healthy to do stuff. I mean, personally, I noticed a pretty strong physical situation with myself about a month ago that I'm still working on and I'm recovering, but I certainly couldn't go through and pass all four of the standards to become a deputy. Could three, but I'm just that's just the truth let alone be a um, volunteer fire person or a paid staff fire person. So it's just amazing what we can do when we really look at the information and try to work together and, pre and present opportunities for folks to actually come together and talk about the strong issues and what can we learn from before. So I am glad that I found those three presentations. Um, reminded of a presentation by CNN in 1985, where they described 60 gigahertz as a military weapon and lightning as weapons in 1985. So that's probably enough for now. I appreciate this presentation. Thank you. I wasn't planning on speaking. I'm Dave Martone. I'm the uh, board chair with Paro Valley Fire. Uh, I don't know if you received the letter that we said uh, sent. We'd like to be a part of the discussions from the start um, for County Fire. We're the largest fire district in the county. And budget constraints, we've downstaffed to two people. We just feel like it'd be just a natural to have us be a part of it from the start rather than wait till this is done and then try and get us to coordinate. And we're very interested in that, having a seat at the table. Thank you. Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. I'm a rural resident in County Fire District, a former fire volunteer, and I've attended many 
uh, Fire Department Advisory Commission FDAC meetings over the many years that I've been a rural resident. Um, I want to point out that the FDAC you dissolved before this happened, and I think that's a real tragedy. Their their uh, expertise, their liaison with the public could have been very beneficial for the process that we are about to move through. I hope that Mr. Joe Serrano here in the room, uh, director of LAFCO, will speak because he has a plan to put forth that will really change things for the better, I think. But uh, it's unfortunate that the FDAC is dissolved and will not be able to participate in that. And we don't know what this advisory group will be like, when it will happen, and what their powers will be. So I want to point out, um, thank you for giving the overview of the um, AP Triton report. I want to pull your attention to what the FDAC members did say. They read it thoroughly. I was there when they discussed it, and they gave you some very good recommendations, their thoughts on it. So look at that, too. They wanted to uh, especially point out that there were there was inaccurate data in the AP Triton report, and that um, the FDAC and CAL FIRE had very little input on the recommendations in this report. So pay attention to that, and I urge you to reach out to your former FDAC commissioner and talk with them. Um, I think that changing over will be a good thing uh, to, to improve the governance. Quite frankly, your board has always put the county fire department budget on the consent agenda. That speaks to me a lot of you, how you consider importance. Also, Proposition 172 money can fund the recommendations that are discussed in here. Later today, you will hear that you got one, our county got $1.7 million more than Mr. anticipated in Prop 172 money. Thank you. you need to fund. Thank you very much for the comments. Thank you. Okay, right, seeing no other members of the public here uh, present in chambers, we're going to go online and see if there's any members of the public online who would like to speak to us on this item. Yes, Chair, we have speakers. Call in user one. Your microphone is now available. Marilyn Guerra, thank you to Becky Steinbrunner. Excuse me, I'd like to refer to a document of June 3rd, 2024, Comments on Community Wildfire Plan, and this relates to Monterey City Council and some city councils in Monterey, but also pertains to here. It's very relevant to Santa Cruz County. This is by Nina Beatty. Dangerous fire conditions and variables exist now in Monterey, and some of these are encouraged by city, state, and federal official agencies. And she elaborates on some causes of fires that are being overlooked. One is smart, meeting, smart meters. Uh, that cause electrical fires which are far hotter than normal building fires. We had one some years ago in Capitola, actually. Smart meter vulnerabilities include inadequate and short-lived surge protection, no direct path to ground, no circuit breakers, catastrophic failures. This document has many references. Electrical wiring in homes and commercial buildings is being degraded by the electromagnetic field. Uh, Frequency emissions of PG&E's electrical so-called smart utility meters, according to arson and fire ex experts. Example, the discovery and science of smart meter fires presentation below. This very dangerous time bomb situation can cause an electrical fire. You have many warnings and documentations of problems with these smart meters. Thank you. Since it's it's we have no further speakers, Chair. Okay. Um, with that, then I'll bring it back to the board for any questions, comments, and direction. I'll start with Supervisor Friend. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this, is, this is a long time coming, actually. Um, 
for many years, I don't think the long-term viability of county fire um, has been secured. It's really been artificially propped up through an amateur agreement, and I don't think financially uh, the long-term success of county fire is likely. I think that the independent district is necessary, and I think that the, this is a beginning process toward moving toward an essential transition. Um, a point sort of more broadly that um, Ms. Steinbrenner is making is that that the area, and, and Director Martone would know this, the area that I represent also subsidizes the whole rest of the county for CSA 48 uh, to a significant tune. So if any of these independent, any of these areas were to be plucked off by, say, a central fire district, it would, it would the entire weight of the system would collapse as a result of it, which I think so the responsible thing for this board to do is to say a few things. One, because of the insecurity of the financial stability of the system. And given that it's a lifeline service, we need to do this review to see uh, what pro what provides for the greatest um, long-term stability. I think that that's the independent district model that LAFCO is looking at right now. In the intermediate time, I think that these changes that are proposed all make sense, but what they really do is just set it up for a transition for another entity to take over long-term, I believe. Um, the current level of service is also I mean, it's a rural fire protection agency, so I guess one could argue either way. But the the, the level of service really isn't, I think, what the residents um, would prefer. And there's a lot of mutual aid and direct aid, as we know that. I mean, I mean, most of the time, if they're going to Ms. Steinbrenner's neighborhood, it's actually Central Fire that's going there first anyway. And so this this understanding of, of how it's being served and where it's being served and what the financial viability is something I don't know that the broader community has really been uh, involved in these discussions. But I... What I just want to highlight is that we're going in the right direction for the long-term sustainability of some entity to provide fire and medical services to rural residents in Santa Cruz County, which I think is very important. Um, I, I I think that the the county fire moniker may not be the name that exists in five or ten years, but I don't think that that matters as much as ensuring that people have a faster response rate. Uh, more folks responding than a 2-0 situation than it is in a lot of these situations now. They get the level of service that they deserve just because. And one element that wasn't, I didn't notice really mentioned in the master plan is there's been a lot of comments from the state. I mean, you never know what, how much of it is bravado and how much of it is real about uh, cuts coming down from Cal Fire to local entities like this and, and how long they're going to continue to have these uh, support networks and what expectations local communities should have. So. Um, I also don't know whether the state long-term viability of their of their subsidy of this is is realistic either. So I think that that we have to do what we're doing. Um, but I just think that a future board, and actually not a future board that long from now, will be uh, incorporating probably a LAFCO recommendation for the creation of an independent district. And I think this is going to be a discussion that every supervisor that represents, um, well, it is every supervisor that represents uh, the county fire jurisdiction is going to be having to have with their community as to why this is a better service component for them. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Supervisor Nenders. Well, other than echoing uh, Chief Martone's comments, you know, to get all the agencies involved in this process, I think is is really important. And, you know, I commend you for all your work and all the work you guys got ahead of you, to, especially with the LAFCO portion of it. Um, that you got ahead of you. So that's it. So if I was going, the comments. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Thank you for this report. Um, it is valuable in uh, providing a sense of where we're going. Um, and I am, uh, I think there's, there's real value in the recommendation to ultimately look at creating an independent fire district. Um, you know, one thing that, that jumped out at me, and I think, uh, Director Beaton, you said this was the most significant finding, in your opinion as well, was just the staffing issues, right? I mean, on good days, we're staffed about half of the national average, and on bad days, we're actually, we'd really want more staffing. We're at about a third of the national average. Um, and it strikes me that part of the reason for that is that we've relied so much uh, on volunteers, and uh, as we've seen with many of the uh, districts throughout uh, the, the, the fire agencies throughout our county that our communities have just changed. People don't have the time uh, to be volunteer firefighters to the same extent that they used to, um, you know, because 
I mean, as we know, the cost of living has increased dramatically in our community, and um, it's, it's just incredibly difficult. Uh, people have to spend more time just uh, working to put food on their table and paying the rent. So you know, this report kind of, uh, one of the recommendations is to uh, hire a, um, you know, vol volunteer recruitment and retention coordinator. Is it, is it really make sense to double down on the volunteer model or, I mean, is there, yeah, are, I mean, my sense is we're kind of um, we're providing some valuable educational services here in training volunteers, but then not really reaping the full benefit of that because people move on to other agencies. I mean, how do, how do we address that as this sort of um, consistent loss of volunteers? Yeah, so th this is not specific to us. Um, statewide, it's nationwide. I recently moved my daughter to Ohio for college and they were had some a fire booth there. So the city of Oberlin, I talked to their fire chief and they have six paid individuals. Everyone else was volunteers that they've had. They've now had to combine paying their volunteers from eight to eight, a somewhat livable wage to be able to maintain the staffing on their fire engine because they've just lost that volunteer model within their community. So that kind of resonated with me that m while we're getting people applying just as today someone did it's just one person and we need 10 people um but it could be outreach might be the the thing to do also a lot of young folks are going back into the trades um it seems like and this is a uh, a good career for folks so maybe we could do that partner with cabrillo we've already partnered with the uh, county office of education um, giving our cal fire 1c training to folks so that they can apply for a job with cal fire but that doesn't mean they cannot go down the path to be a county volunteer as well. So it's it's not just here specific; it's across the nation. Right. Yeah. I and mean, it's interesting you mentioned the compensation piece of it. I mean, my understanding is we can uh, currently offer our volunteers up to like twenty percent of the, the compensation level that um, a professional firefighter would make. I mean, should we look at increasing that as a way to find a you know, better middle ground. So we we pay our volunteers per call. We call them volunteers, but on paper they're paid call volunteers. They get paid per call, and we have a stipend, and then we pay that annually in December. Um, other districts within the county have had uh, retention and recruitment issues, and they've raised their stipend, and they saw no difference in individuals responding based on the increase in compensation. If that's something the board would like to look at, we we can always uh, look at that and and see if that moves the needle. Well, that doesn't sound like uh, there's reason to believe it will. So, I mean, of course, then the um, you know alternative here is uh, you know, the other recommendation, which is look long term at uh, staffing through the fire stations completely twenty four seven three sixty five um, with with uh, professional staff. Um, you know, uh, that provides a much higher level of service, but of course at a, at a huge cost, right? I mean, if I'm reading the numbers right, that looks like a 50% increase in the cost for the entire department um, in the, you know, relatively near term. Um, how should we talk about that, you know, I, in a way that um, the community can get excited about <laughs> Right. I mean, obviously, you know, some improvement in the level of service, but, you know, I'm worried that it's like, oh, wow, well, we've got this serious problem here. Uh, and the county is just going to push it off to another, you know, independent special district that we're, you know, getting, getting rid of the problem. How can we talk about it? You know, first of all, in a way that it's setting, uh, you know, us all up for success and that ultimately um, these costs are going to be affordable for the folks who actually live in this potential district in the future. So I know in the report, the recommendation actually came across three different recommendations on how to do a 365, 24 seven for three fire stations. Uh, one of those is the expensive model where we do pay for uh, having the staff here. And that is a model that based on our current finances, I don't think CSA 48 could attain. Uh, the other two options does rely a little bit more heavily on use of volunteers and developing a potential different strategy on how to re retain and recruit volunteers. I know Chief Wilson mentioned earlier, uh, yeah, Chief Wilson men mentioned earlier uh, about potentially doing a shift stipend versus a paid call uh, type stipend. So you can actually guarantee you'll have uh, that firefighter there 
at the station during that time, just in case you have a phone call. Uh, also potentially augmenting, looking at the eight to eight uh, time frame, knowing that 70% of our fire calls are during that high period of time. There's also some uh, state changes that um, uh, we believe are coming down the pipe that might be advantageous to our county. Uh, we're still waiting for the operational component to work out from CAL FIRE, uh, but we do believe uh, financially the county would have a benefit with it staying with the cooperative agreement. Uh, with CAL FIRE, and we might be able to figure out how we can augment and really help address that shortage, which is very evident, evident in this report uh, for the firefighters during the peak fire season, which I would consider the most critical need for our county. Okay, um, that's encouraging. I, I mean, I guess, you know, back to my fundamental question is, is, is there a future where we're not looking at crushing increases in the cost for folks who live in this district? I mean, these people are already dealing with huge increases in insurance. I mean, could we say that like increases in funding for the fire service is going to lead to decreases uh, in insurance costs because of an improved ISO score? I mean, again, like, and, and you talk about a more hybrid model than just, you know, all relying entirely on professional staff. I mean, I think that was a $5.8 million per year option. You know, the hybrid model is for and change. So it's not, I mean, yes, it's, it's better, but it's not like it's still 40% more than the current budget. Uh, well, on the insurance, um, I'm not sure if there'd be a direct correlation of a better service being provided and the insurance being lowered. Um, I think what we need to look at or the, the board needs to look at is what they want county fire or this independent fire district to be 10, 15 years down the road. We always seem to look where we're going to be in like a year or two. We need to look 15 to 20 years down the road we want to have seven stations, ALS, X, Y, and Z, and then work backwards and see what that's going to look like and see if that's even something that's feasible and then go from there instead of kind of like, okay, we want to get to here in two years and then it's going to increase costs. And we don't have enough money and we're just kind of kicking the can down the road. Right. Well, I appreciate some more comprehensive look at where we want to go. Um, and obviously, um, county fire is not the only fire agency in our, our county um, that is, is struggling with some of these questions, as uh, Director Bartone highlighted. Um, and so hopefully working together, we are able to uh, address some of these costs in a, in a collaborative uh, and effective way. Thanks. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, thank, thanks for general services and the department, uh, the uh, fire department advisory committee uh, commission for developing the plan along with LAFCO, who's the director, Joe Serrano is here today. Uh, it really puts together, I think, the pieces uh, and take a hard look at the challenges we face uh, related to the county fire. And there are many of them uh, to all of our four or uh, to all of our local fire districts. And I have four in San Lorenzo Valley. Um, Resources really are, are really deeply constrained and um, the volunteer system is um, had its day, I'm afraid, uh, realistically. And I can't, I, I don't know how we can thank those past and present who are volunteers today, because thank you, God, you've been there when we needed you. Um, the uh, the recommendation in this plan is uh, that we need to be prioritized uh, into a strategic plan. I think that is about time. It's a long time coming. We really need to have a blueprint for the future of our fire services. Um, and even though I'm not going to be part of this board uh, and part of that prioritization uh, discussion, uh, I'm relieved that the process has started. It's long overdue, and I really think we need to do it to better serve the people of Santa Cruz County. <laughs> Um, well, I just want to um, thank you all for the presentation, for all the hard work that um, the GSD, our fire chiefs, and um, our fire advisory commission has done to get us to this point where we are today. Um, the one question I have um, that hasn't been answered already, or maybe you can help, um, is just what's being done um, for people to more easily volunteer to become firefighters. I know a few folks up in Bonnie Dune who were interested, and I've heard, you know, the amount of training that people have to go through really makes it um, challenging for folks to be able to work and get the hours in that they need in order for them to be able to become volunteer firefighters and really deters folks from wanting to do it. And I know that that's probably, I'm just assuming that's probably changed since how it was in the past and just wondering if maybe you could speak to that a little bit because, you know, if, if there's ways in which we can uh, make it 
or there's ways in which we can facilitate people being able to become volunteer firefighters. Maybe that is one piece of the puzzle that can help us get more people involved. And so maybe you'll get to speak to that a little given your experience. I'll, I'll start. Um, so we, we noticed probably in 2012, 11, that there was somewhat of a reduction of, of volunteers happening. So we developed an EMR. So there's a medical only type volunteer and then a fire responder as well with, with medical, which allowed for uh, folks to participate being a volunteer with companies continue in their community. Um, and that's that we still have that program now and it, it kind of ebbs and flows. Um, but that allows some people to test the waters to see if they want to maybe jump over to the fire side um, from the EMR side. And we do have those folks that go through on the training thing. There's OSHA mandates, state mandates, and federal mandates for the number of hours that are necessary to do specific uh, firefighting uh, items. And those continue to add up every year. Uh, when I started as a volunteer in Mariposa County at 18 years old on the dot, you took 32 hours of training, you got your gear, you were able to respond to a call after that was over. Now we're somewhere close to 300, min 360 minimum. Um, so it has grown exponentially. So it is a huge commitment for those individuals. That's a lot of time away from their family, um, their weekends, et cetera. So we understand that. Some of the things we've implemented to make it easier for folks to volunteer is uh, historically within County Fire, you would apply and you could not participate in volunteer training until your application was approved, which happened in November. So if you applied in January, you got to stand around in the cold evenings or the hot Saturday that you participated and, and or not participate, just watch. So <laughs> we've been able to change through risk management that when someone submits an application, we can approve that application and they can participate in training um, up until the academy starts where they receive the formalized training to be certified to be able to respond. Um, and that's helped out quite a bit retaining people because standing around for nine months, going to get tired and move on. Um, so we're able to involve them right away. And then we started an online application process um, through our new website, thanks to uh, ISD. Um, that allows people to input information that they want to be a volunteer, and then we directly reach out to them, make contact, put them in uh, contact with the company officer at that volunteer company of our five volunteer companies, and then they foster a relationship, get them to apply officially, and uh, bring them into the county fire family. Great. That's really helpful. And to the extent you all can share some of those you know, resources with us so that we can, you know, push it out in our newsletters to try and encourage people to apply. It'd be really helpful to get those links so that we can try to, you know, encourage folks to to join our volunteer um, fire departments. Um, but I just want to say that I'm supportive of the direction this is going in. Um, I do agree with some of the statements that have been made um, around incorporating the local fire chief chiefs in the conversation. And so um, as part of the direction, I'm hoping that the board would consider, in addition to having the Director of General Services collaborate with the local information commission, um, that they also um, include the local fire chiefs throughout the county um, to explore the feasibility of converting county fire to an independent fire district. I, I agree with the statements made that having folks in the conversation early, it just makes a lot of sense that we're all able to um, provide input early on in the process and not delay it even further. So um, that's the only recommendation that I would make in addition to what's, um, what staff is recommending. And yeah, just again, want to thank you all for your hard work on this. I know we've got a lot of other items, so I'm going to end my comments there and see if there's a, a motion. Um, um, just as a point of clarification. So in the case of director Martone, I think, I mean, it's not really a fire chief um, situation. It would be working with, um, some of the boards as well that we represent us with county fire. So I just want to expand out what you're saying. Is that okay? Yeah. All right. So I'll move the recommended actions with the additional direction uh, to work with uh, local fire chiefs as well as Pajaro Fire, Valley Fire, and um, some of the others that we serve within uh, the county fire family. Second. So a motion by Supervisor Friend, second by Supervisor McPherson with the additional direction. I'll turn to the clerk for roll call vote on this item. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. McPherson. Aye. And Cummings. Aye. 
that passes unanimously. Thank you all again, and look forward to seeing the strategic plan and how this all kind of comes together. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, are we okay with continuing along? All right. So with that, we'll move on to item number nine, consider establishing a temporary ad hoc subcommittee to prepare revisions to the hosted rental and vacation rental ordinances and take related actions. This is an item um, that's being proposed by myself and Supervisor Koenig, but I'll turn it over to Supervisor Koenig to kick us off. Uh, well, thank you, Chair. Um, you know, I want to start my comments by just saying I think that uh, the county has made huge strides as far as addressing vacation rentals, uh, most notably since the passage of uh, Measure B, um, hiring a dedicated code compliance officer. Um, and so uh, John Nielsen, who's filling that role today, is just doing a, a really fantastic job. And I think for the first time in a long time, we have uh, both really good data uh, and good enforcement on this issue. Um, but there is still a long ways to go. Um, so, for example, um, you know, we know we've got around 70 illegal uh, vacation rentals operating in our county today. Um, and while Mr. Nielsen uh, can go after each one of those individually uh, and try to get them to take down their listings um, and, and ultimately um, in, enforce, uh, take enforcement action against them, um, it would be a lot faster and more efficient just to work with uh, hosting platforms and uh, get them to take those down. And right now, our ordinance um, you know, requires us to ask nicely, but doesn't uh, have any teeth. Whereas other communities like um, Santa Monica have actually uh, litigated this issue and uh, with updates to the ordinance uh, made it so that uh, the hosting platforms uh, are responsible if they work with unpermitted uh, listings. Um, and so you know, that's just, I think, one basic example of how our local ordinance can be improved. Um, you know, another is that right now our, our ordinance is uh, pretty biased uh, towards uh, unhosted uh, investor owned properties rather than uh, homeowners. And so um, we, we for outside of the specific areas uh, that are designated in our ordinance, um, Unhosted rentals are, are greatly are, are unlimited, whereas hosted rentals uh, have a cap of 250. Um, so I don't know what the number of unhosted rentals uh, in our community should be, but it's probably not unlimited. Um, you know, one of the folks commenting earlier today said, um, "Well, you know, the growth is really slowed, and uh, we, we don't need to change this." But I mean, I'm looking at the dashboard for vacation uh, rentals right now, I mean, we've got 30 pending applications. Um, just for vacation or unhosted rental. So um, it's still an issue that, um, you know, continues to grow. And I think uh, that we could look for some improvements here. Um, you know, part of the reason why we're, uh, uh, Chair Cummings and I uh, chose to bring this forward is the proposal to create a subcommittee. I mean, obviously we could have actually crafted an ordinance and brought that forward today, but our thought was twofold. First of all, uh, we wanted the input of the current board who has worked on this issue extensively on general direction uh, uh, for this. Second, um, right now, uh, the, you know, in an alternate um, ad hoc committee, I think we're considering setting our own rules for this board as far as how much staff time to engage on any particular issue uh, before, um, you know, having a review and vote by the whole board. So we thought this was a good um, you know, and again, we don't want to engage uh, staff and take up a ton of time and particularly want to um, you know, prevent this from uh, being the only thing that the planning department looks at for the next uh, uh, five months, um, six months, um, and really hope to shoulder a lot of that burden uh, through, I think, our own offices and working directly with county council. But it is probable that we'd need uh, more than just eight hours of time um, over the coming months. And so... Again, wanted to um, just sort of daylight this with the whole board uh, for that reason as well and, and get some agreement uh, to address this issue. Uh, so I'll um, leave my comments there. And uh, yeah, Chair Cummings, return to you. Thank you, Supervisor Koenig. And um, I'll just say that um, during my time on the California Coastal Commission, um, this has been an issue that's been coming up. And I do understand that in the past, the Coastal Commission was really in favor of unhosted short-term rentals. Um, I will say that last December, we had a workshop 
to discuss vacation rentals, and one of the experts who was on the panel uh, made the recommendation that through their data analysis, they've noticed that um, the unintended negative consequences of having unhosted rentals has reduced housing stock in many communities. And what they were recommending is that, um, you know, with the intent of Airbnb being for, you know, people who might be empty nesters that have a lot of space, that having hosted rentals actually has less of an impact on housing within the community. Um, we've seen a number of other jurisdictions, um, Marin County comes to mind, Pacifica comes to mind, where they have started revisiting their short-term rental policies and have implemented a number of uh, caps on the number of uh, unhosted rentals and short-term rentals in the community and also um, have done things like limiting the number of permits. So, for example, if you own a property and you want to have a short-term rental, you get one permit versus a company coming in and buying up a lot of housing stock and getting a permit for each and every um, short-term rental um, for each property that they own, which makes a lot of sense if we want to provide people with some of that flexibility. Um, and so um, we're hoping to explore some of these other um, policies that have been implemented in other communities. And since we've been seeing these changes at the Coastal Commission, we're pretty confident that if we were to move forward and to begin to um, really try to promote keeping housing in our housing stock for families and working folks in our community, that we'd be um, successful in being able to make some changes to our current policies. And so with that, I'm happy to either open it for comments from board members today, given our, or we can open up to the public first. But either. Yeah, I'll, I'll be happy to provide some some comments uh, because as uh, Supervisor Koenig noted, um, I've sat through many, 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 many hours of discussion on all these elements because we went from nothing to having to create something, including um, threats of litigation and settlements with some of the platforms that led to some of where we are. So we should be aware of that there's a broader, just sort of a broader context here. Um, as the person, um, your predecessor had started the very first series and then I brought forward all the, the following series. Um, as you know, this impacts the first and second district uh, the most. And so, I mean, just selfishly, I'd like whoever the person that follows me to have a larger role, then it seems like this ad hoc committee is really creating for it wouldn't really be possible. But I think that really those are the two districts that should be creating this, the, the conversation. This isn't a, a knock on you, this chair, but I mean, there's, you literally have like five in your district. So, I mean, I mean, versus the hundreds that we have in ours, I think that realistically we're creating an ad hoc committee. It should be uh, either, I mean, I really don't want to do this, but either the two of us now or, or the second district person moving forward, but I'll say this, um, when we had planning take a look and survey those that were doing hosted rent hosted rentals um people it was a self obviously there's a self i mean people were just self-reporting but it was about one in five that acknowledged that they'd had a long-term renter that they were now transitioning from uh to a hosted even so we knew that there was a loss of stock of rental long-term rental stock even with the host even though the hosted functionally have no community-based impacts beyond that element and i'm sure the number is higher than that because this is somebody that was reporting it on the short-term rental um we believe the number to be higher though it's been very challenging to actually figure that out what my recommendation would be just from a simplification standpoint although this has much more that you're looking to look at of this i think that unless this future board is actually looking to reduce the number of currently permitted folks within the designated zones which are basically the coastal zone i think that this should just be a modification of the current ordinance on unhosted rentals to just provide the cap at the current number outside of those designated zones. I mean, that that's the most elegant way to do this because then there's no continued expansion, which I think is the issue um, and would save a lot of time for everybody. Also, um, I appreciate that. I mean, especially you're serving on it, but Coastal was adamant um, that we they didn't even support the cap. I mean, this was a lot of discussions I had with Dan and others over there to try and even get to where we were at. And it and they came back to us and made modifications. We came back to them after our modifications. They came back to us again. And this is we've done six different iterations of this ordinance. So just know that this took years, literally. So I would just recommend we kind of leave what's already been decided within the designated zones alone so that we don't have to go through this process again and that we stay outside of the coastal zone and therefore we don't have to worry about coastal commission and then we can just because uh, we had always felt that we are leaving this other element untouched and i think it's totally fair to have that conversation now which is to say that we've never dealt with the unmitigated growth even if it's one or two or three it's still 
it's not controlled outside of the designated zones, which is functionally the highway. I mean, it's really sort of the easiest way to view it. And anything north of the highway currently has no caps. Um, I There was a pretty significant fight and a 3-2 vote on the capping the hosted rentals at the time, as, as my colleague might remember. Um, and we haven't even reached the cap of that number. So I think that we're comfortable with also that number being where that is. I don't think that that's really creating a problem. So all I'm trying to do is simplify for whoever the ad hoc committee is. I think what the what I would recommend this board do is just review the caps on that. Now, if you want to have compliance elements of takedowns from the the um, the platforms, I think that's actually a better letter coming from county council than the chair, just for what it's worth. And I think that that's a, a reasonable conversation to have. If there's noise issues, I think that's a reasonable thing to have. But I'm just trying to narrow, I think, where we're at moving forward. And then, then we know that the housing stock will only be as impacted as what our current number is. And there won't be growth outside of these zones. And uh, we have all the other protections already built into the ordinance where it doesn't transfer with ownership and all these various other things. And so I think that, that we've had... Um, um, this will be the first time in 12 years planning would thank me for something. So I figured that I actually, if I try and make their life a little bit easier, I think that that is probably the easiest way to do this moving forward. That's my recommendation. And yeah, I guess I'll, I'll just open up for comments from board members. Yeah, um, yeah I, I appreciate the, the effort of the chair and supervisor Koenig. Uh, we'll take a closer look at the challenges we face with this, um, which by several measures of uh, our area, as we see as the most expensive rental market, maybe uh, certainly in the state, maybe the nation. I, I hope the ad hoc committee will carefully consider the impact of uh, the county of losing TOT, transit occupancy tax uh, revenue. Um, and we should also be mindful of some property owners need uh, to earn income from their homes in order to continue affording them in this day and age. Um, I understand the focus is likely to be on unhosted rentals, um, likely the result of property owners of investors who don't reside in these locations. But there's also the situations in which property owners live on the site, but to vacate temporarily for short periods so they can uh, have an income producing option that uh, we should preserve. Um, I also hope the ad hoc committee will look at the possible benefits of encouraging similar uh, regulations among the county and its four cities uh, to create it, um, an even playing field, uh, field in terms of jurisdictions. And now maybe that's going to expand it more than we want. We have enough on our plate as it is, but uh, I think it would be good if we, we are kind of on the same page with the four cities in the county to some degree as, as close as we can get. I did request the uh, uh, TOT revenue from our auditor's office uh, related to revenue uh, the county takes in on short-term rentals um, versus traditional lodging op options. And to read some of these, the most recent figures available indicate that from July 2022 to March 2023, the county took in $6.8 million in TOT revenue from around uh, 1,200 rental properties and hosted rentals uh, compared to $2.8 million in the unincorporated uh, 20 hotels or motels that uh, so it would it's it's going to it could have a revenue impact that should be addressed or looked into at least um, be, but short term rentals bring in roughly two and a half times uh, the revenue uh, as our hotels mo motels in the unincorporated area. That said, we know that there's also a financial impact created by our lack of housing in the community, which is very hard to quantify, um, can't be overstated. So my request is the committee consider that balancing act when evaluating our opportunities for improvement to talk with the cities uh, to try to get their read on it or what their regulations are so we can have a countywide uh, uh, policy of sorts uh, if we can. It could take a lot of time, but I think it would be a good thing in the end. Supervisor Hernandez. Thank you. Um, you know, I think uh, Supervisor Zach is right. If uh, the board chair has five, I'd probably have four in my district. <laughs> so I'm not sure who, exactly who's going on the ad hoc committee, but, you know, I'll be part of one of those cities. But even though I only got four, um, you know, I'd like to see, make sure that this uh, ad hoc committee is diverse, that it has everybody, right? Just to be fair, homeowners, renters, and like even some of the folks that were here earlier today that are that do participate as part of Airbnb uh, properties, I guess. Um, and I think that it would be good if this uh, ad hoc committee also 
uh, explore the economic impacts that uh, Supervisor McPherson was talking about. Um, you know, beyond the TOT, I think there's, you know, the shopping that they do in our communities. So it's important to look at that too. But I think for the most part, I think I'd like to see a diverse ad hoc committee with this. Mr. Chair, if I may, I just don't want to overcomplicate this. I mean, if at the end of the day, this is what I'm going to read into your document, okay, which is that you feel, I believe that you feel that there needs, that we need to cap where we're at and we shouldn't have growth and that we have some problems and on enforcement and regulatory we can deal with. That can be dealt with without having like a large scale community based process. I'm just saying that we, we can do this by just capping them outside of the zones that are already capped. I mean, I mean, it doesn't seem like it's that hard to do. And, and we can, um, the other things are regulatory compliance discussions that, you know, if you need direction because of the new ad hoc committee, and I agree with that to direct county council to do these things, I think we just do that. So I just, I'm just trying to simplify it. I don't think it even takes till March to do this, by the way. I mean, I'm not saying it needs to come back while I'm still here, but I just think that it, it, it can be, your goals can be accomplished a lot faster um, with a simpler direction. I'll just say that. Thank you. All right, with that, I'm going to open up to members of the public to see if there's members of the public who would like to speak to us on this item. If so, you're more than happy to come forward to the podium, and we'll give you two minutes. Hello. Uh, my name is Joe Hall. I live in Live Oak, and thank you for taking this step. I think some change is needed. It was a long process. I remember standing here 14 years ago testifying on this. And it's kind of an irony now because uh, the state says build housing and they're building. And the other hand, we have housing being lost. In our particular area in Live Oak, we could lose up to 20% of the housing. We're not there yet, but we could be at some point. And there's also another issue that came up in ours that uh, wasn't really addressed, and it's now available for people who live in Morro Bay. You don't have to have a vacation rental on each side of you, front and back. And on 14th Avenue, we actually have two cases now where people have vacation rentals all around them. It's kind of a very difficult situation for them. Uh, finally, uh, uh, Supervisor McPherson mentioned working with the city. Santa Cruz in 2017, when uh, board member Cummings was on, passed an absolute ban and no more non-hosted vacation rentals. They said enough's enough and they capped it and went on from there. I doubt if they'll go back because that was a really long process and there was a lot on it. What it means though is Live Oak is in the middle. Santa Cruz has banned them. Capitol, except for the village, is banned non-hosted vacation rentals. Can you pull the mic to your mouth? Can you pull the mic up to your mouth? There you go. It, it keeps going in and out. Oh, so. it is. Oh, okay. Sorry. Anyhow, uh, and also there's ongoing recruitment for this. This is for one house in Live Oak, one block from the line of the Loda. This is what we get in one year. Uh, I'll leave one and you can just read it if you're curious. It basically starts out and says, make money. Anyhow, I hope as you work through on this, you do come up with some of the common sense uh, reforms that Supervisor uh, Friend said. But also, I think you need to look at spacing. And you might also want to look at a cap even in the vacation rental areas. You don't need to turn your whole vacation rental between Live Oak and Live Oak between Capitol and Santa Cruz into a motel. Thank you. Thanks so much. Is there any other member of the public here in person who'd like to speak to us on this item? Okay, seeing none, we'll go online and see if there's any member of the public online who'd like to speak to us on this item. So just like to ask the clerk if there's anybody online. Um, we have no speakers online. Okay, so I'll bring it back to the board. Um, I'll turn to Supervisor Koenig to see if there are any further comments. Um, not, uh, well, I mean, I'll just, something that was mentioned by Supervisor Friend as, as well as, um, uh, Mr. Hall here is that you know, well, whereas the current district boundaries or for, for the, uh, the Salsta in Aptos go all the way to the highway in Live Oak, they're very, I think it's Portola, right? So, I mean, um, anyway, this is very, still very much a problem in the, the coastal area outside of, uh, the designated areas and, um, one that, you know, urgently needs to be addressed. I'm trying to figure out how to, address some of the, the comments, suggestions that, that you brought up, Supervisor Friend, and incorporate them into a motion here. I guess, you know, maybe a question for you. Are you suggesting that we not form an ad hoc committee at all and just maybe direct staff, you know, provide some direction to staff to work on this so that, uh, but then have the flexibility to 
whatever, communicate with all supervisors equally. You know, I, I love the idea of you having to be on an ad hoc committee. Actually, <laughs> this uh, makes my day. Um, so no, I'm fine with the ad hoc committee. I'm just saying that for every, right now we have a cap in these designated zones. It's a little bit complicated because there's certain streets that are excluded from the cap, like in my district, for example, Beach Drive, for example. However, um, there's a functional cap within the designated zones. I'm just saying from all areas outside of the zone, the ordinance shall cap at today's number. So I, mean, that, I just think that that's really what we're trying to do here anyway. Um, I don't think that the two ordinances necessarily need to be merged because there was reasons why they were actually kept separate at the time. And I'm trying to make it as elegant as possible. All the other things you talk about here are fine. But those are direction to on compliance that I think the ad hoc committee can work out. And, and I wasn't trying to say that you couldn't do it. I just felt that since it all impacts my district, you know, uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll leave it with the two of you uh, to have fun with this. And I think that that would be the simplest way to do it. So if I can, so maybe as part of the direction, if we could bring back a cap on on host rentals outside of the districts as a first step. Um, so, if, I mean, I think we've been talking about moratoriums or what have you, and it seems like that would kind of get at, I think, what Supervisor Friend is um, bringing up. And then we could continue to work on other policy related, but as a first step, maybe that's, it seems like maybe that could be a first step of moving forward. Okay, so I'll move the recommended actions um, with the additional direction that uh, on on recommended action three that county council send the letter to vacation rental hosting platforms um, rather than the chair, and that the uh, with additional direction on item um, recommended action one that uh, the ad hoc committee focus on um, establishing caps outside of the existing designated areas. Uh, and other enforcement uh, improvements. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll, I'll second that. Um, and then I, I do wonder if we want to leave some flexibility and for um, some of the other issues that have come up um, because I do think that some of the other jurisdictions that have move forward making some of these changes for example um you know the idea that um people shouldn't be able to buy up large amounts of housing stock and get permits for you know all the housing that they buy up in the community i think for the folks who've done it already you know we can grandfather them in but moving forward we should consider you know if somebody wants to have an unhosted rental it's like you can have one but it doesn't make sense for you to have 10 right because we really want to make sure that um we have housing for more people in the community. So I'm just wondering if there can be some flexibility for us to consider other policies as well as part of that subcommittee. But as a first action, we could bring forward that cap on um, unhosted short-term rentals outside of the coastal zone. And I'd like to say I didn't interpret it as you, as you not having that flexibility in the ad hoc committee to do exactly that. So you, you're empowered to do that. My, my sense is that some of these things are actually already covered under our lack of transferability and other elements within the current ordinance, but that would be a discussion that you can have more directly with county council. Yeah, and also my interpretation of uh, this motion and additional direction is not to exclude us to yeah, from looking at that, I mean, effectively, I think what you're suggesting is a, a different way of looking at a cap too, right? Um, so yep. um, I think we still have the flexibility needed to, to evaluate some of these options. And then I, I'll just say, um, I hear what uh, Supervisor McPherson has brought up around finances and how that could be impacted. And so definitely happy to, to look at that as well. And, and I think part of, you know, this effort will be to do outreach to folks in the community. So I think that, um, you know, we definitely want to have that as, as part of it, similar to some of the other work that we've been doing where we, we're conducting outreach with um, stakeholders throughout the community. Yeah. And, and actually, thanks for, for bringing that up because, I mean, we've had a number of people who have asked to be part of the subcommittee. And I think, um, you know, ultimately our goal would be to interview various groups involved in this issue um, without them necessarily having to be members of the subcommittee and, you know, creating more uh, conflicts around scheduling and just making it harder to um, move this work forward in general. Yep. So. so I'm supportive of the motion. Seconded. All right. So with that, uh, we have a motion by Supervisor Koenig, um, seconded by Supervisor Cummings, and I'll turn to the clerk for roll call vote. Could you restate the additional direction, please? Yes, yeah, sure. So the additional direction on uh, action one is for the subcommittee to focus on um, caps outside of the existing designated areas uh, and in, um, opportunities for improved enforcement. And the additional uh, um, uh, uh, action.
actions on item three are for county council to send a letter to vacation rental hosting platforms instead of the chair. Thank you. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. McPherson. Aye. And Cummings. Aye. That passes unanimously. Thank you all for your support and we look forward to working with um, folks in our community on, you know, trying to address um, this issue. Okay, so the next item, um, as the Board of Directors of the Davenport County Sanitation District, hold a public hearing and consider approval in concept of an ordinance amending District Code Chapter 3.08, Articles 3, 4, and 6 related to water service charges, billing and collection of water service charges and refunds, and an ordinance amending District Code Chapter 4.08, Articles 3, 4, and 6 related to sewer service charges, billing and collection of sewer service charges and refunds, consider related sequence notice of exemption, and take related actions. And with that, I'll turn it over to staff for a presentation on this item. Good morning, Super er, Chair Cummings and Board. Um, Ashley Trujillo, I'm the Senior Engineer for the Davenport County Sanitation District. And I'm here today to talk about these two proposed changes to our code. We have set this public hearing date on August 27th, and today we'd like to have you open the public hearing, and we will return on October 8th for the final adoption. So the two changes that we are proposing is, one is that we need to set our sewer rates annually, and we do this in accordance with the um, California Health and Safety Code and also with Proposition 218. And uh, the code, though, requires us to come to the board four times to achieve the goal of changing the rates, where the other codes, um, the health and safety code, only require us to come three times because we could set the same rates by resolution instead of by ordinance. So we'd like to streamline this process to help stave on staff time and also just to have a smaller window um, between when we start those board actions and when those um, rates can go into effect. The second change we are proposing is um, having to do with our refunds. If someone is charged incorrectly because they're either we're on septic and they never knew and then they discover, hey, we're on septic and we've been paying for sewer, um, or if they've just been billed maybe for an extra unit we thought they had, uh, we'd like to put some limits on those refund requests. We Right now, they can um, it's unlimited, but we'd like to say that they have to request the refund within three years of discovering the, when they were last charged, and then that the refund period that they're requesting refund for not exceed five years, and the district engineer would be authorized to approve the refund. So we bring the recommended actions to you today um, to please conduct the public hearing on these code changes, to consider the proposed notice of exemption from the California Environmental Quality Act, approve in concept these code changes, and then direct the clerk of the board to publish the notice of proposed ordinance summary in a newspaper of general circulation at least five days prior to the scheduled second reading and final adoption no later than October 2nd of 2024. Um, and then direct the clerk of the board to schedule the second reading and public adoption of the ordinance on October 8th. And I'm available for any questions. Great, thank you for that presentation. Is there any member of the public who would like to speak to us on this item? If so, please approach the podium. We will have two minutes. Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner. I live in Aptos, but I have many friends in Davenport. And when I first read this, I, I interpreted it that after five years, there would be no refunds. So I appreciate your presentation. And I just want to clarify that um, if someone is owed a refund, they have three years in perpetuity. It's not going to cut it off. It's not going to sunset the refund policy per se. Is that correct? Correct. What's they find that they are owed a refund as, yeah. as long as it's not more than three years ago, they can mm -hmm. re request a refund that will give them five years of back payment. All right. And thank you. And have people been waiting longer than that amount of time to request refunds? 
Maybe what we can do is you can ask your questions, and then okay. after public comment, we can see if staff okay. can address those questions. Thank you. I'm I'm just trying to understand what brought this uh, sunsetting policy forward. Has there been a problem with uh, customers waiting a long time and then putting in uh, a request for a refund that had to be paid because there was no sunset time? Thank you. Thank you. Um, is there any member of the public here and person who'd like to speak to us on this item? Seeing none, is there anyone online would like to speak to us on this item? We have no speakers online. True. Okay, so maybe if we could speak to the question about kind of what brought the sunsetting policy forward, maybe that'll help clarify some of the questions that uh, Ms. Steinbrenner brought up. Yes, so um, this proposed change aligns the code with our Santa Cruz County Sanitation District code that we just made this change for. And in that district, we did have some people um, who after we approached them, to get a temporary construction easement on their property, um, tried to find other things perhaps that they could try to um, get more money from the district and then they went further back in time. <laughs> Got it. Okay. Um, any questions or comments from board members? Great seeing none. Um, just really want to appreciate all the work that's um, been done on this and um, look forward to making sure folks are aware of the, of the action that's taken today in Davenport and um, that if people have questions, we'll encourage them to reach out. And so with that, um, I'd like to see if a uh, board member would like to make a motion on item number 10. I'll move the recommended actions. Second. Okay. Motion by Supervisor Friend, seconded by Supervisor McPherson. I'll ask the clerk for a roll call vote. Supervisor Koenig. Friend. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. McPherson. And Cummings. Aye. That passes with uh, Supervisor Koenig absent. Okay, so we'll move right along to our next item. Um, item number 11, as the Board of Directors of the Freedom County Sanitation District, hold a public hearing to consider approval in concept of an ordinance amending District Code Title Three, Chapter 3.08, Articles 3, 4, and 6 related to sewer service charges, billing and collection of sewer service charges and refunds, consider related sequent notice of exemption and take related action. I'll pass it back to Ms. Trio. I thank you. So now I am representing the Freedom County Sanitation District and we are bringing to you the same changes we just discussed for the Davenport County Sanitation District. So these changes to our code would allow us to set rates by resolution and also set some limits for our um, sewer refunds. And the schedule is the same as presented for Davenport. And so we'd like you to please open the public hearing to discuss these two ordinance changes that, um, that we have discussed previously. And this would bring the code in line with our other sanitation districts. So our recommended actions are that you please open the public hearing, consider the proposed notice of exemption from CEQA, approve in concept the changes to these ordinances and direct the clerk of the board to publish the notice of the proposed ordinance of the summary in the newspaper and direct the clerk of the board to schedule the second reading and final adoption of the ordinance on October 8th. I'm here for questions. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to open the public hearing to see if there's any member of the public who would like to speak to us on this item. Okay, seeing none, is there any member of the public online? We have no speakers online. Okay, we'll close public hearing and bring it back to the board for action, uh, comments, or questions. Supervisor Friend. I'll move the recommended actions. Second. All right, so the motion by Supervisor Friend, seconded by Supervisor Hernandez to move the staff recommendation. And with that, I'll turn to the clerk for a roll call vote. Supervisor Koenig. Friend. All right. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? And Cummings? Aye. Aye. That passes unanimously. Thank you. Um, I have a quick question um, in terms of process. I know that we have um, items on closed session. Um, the next two items in our regular session uh, may be fairly long. And so I'm wondering if it would be possible for us to go into closed session so we can have lunch and then come back to um, the other two items after closed session. Absolutely. Okay. So um, why don't we... Uh, break for closed session. Um, I guess we we can I'd like to come back at one thirty. One thirty. One thirty. Would that be? That right? sounds good. Okay. And um, is there anything to report out of closed session? Nothing. Okay. Thank you very much. So we're gonna um, recess to closed session, and we'll be back with our regular agenda items, items over twelve and thirteen at one thirty this afternoon, and we will see you all then. <laughs>
Right, welcome back, everyone. I hope everyone had a nice lunch. Um, we're going to move into our next item on our regular agenda, which is item number 12. Consider status report on transportation project prioritization tool and take related actions. And I'll turn it over to Nicole Coburn, Steve Wiesner, Assistant Director of DPW, Lana Martinez-Davis, Senior Administrative Analyst, and take it away. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Cummings, Board Members, uh, CEO Palacios, and members of the public. My name is Steve Wiesner, uh, Assistant Director of Public Works with Community Development and Infrastructure. Here with me today to help present is Nicole Coburn, Assistant CAO, and Lana Martinez-Davis, Public Works CEO Analyst. We're here today to present a report back to your board, which precipitated from the CDI budget presentation to your board on May 22nd this year. Your board had requested a, a more robust prioritization ranking system for transportation projects, a report back on some critical storm damage repairs, and an update on Measure K as it relates to transportation funding. I will note that Measure K is also being presented um, comprehensively today on item 13 just after this. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Great, thank you. Um, our presentation today will cover um, a transportation prioritization uh, tool that we've drafted um, for presentation today, some emergency project updates, and again, I'll touch on the Measure K allocation proposal we have before you. Next slide, please. And then so for now I'll turn it over to Nicole for, for the intro to the presentation. So um, good afternoon, Chair Cummings and members of the board. I'm Nicole Coburn, Assistant CAO. Um, since the May 22nd budget hearing for CDI, CDI staff and CAO staff have been working diligently to deliver a model that takes into consideration all transportation projects. Um, as you may recall, staff began with the previously used tool that we had developed with CDI to assess storm damage projects from 2017 and 2023. Um, we quickly realized that this tool um, needed to be expanded or developed in different ways um, because of all of the different types of projects that we have. Um, this resulted in some complexity that required a thorough examination. Since May 22nd, staff have been studying various models used by many other California counties, the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission, and the county's Capital Projects Review Committee. We also felt it was important to seek input from our county safety partners, including the Sheriff's Office, County Fire, and the Office of Response, Recovery, and Resilience. Um, we also were looking into tools that included equity as a criteria, for evaluating infrastructure projects. Um, I wanna note that today's presentation and the tool we're gonna be talking about is just conceptual. We're still in the beginning stages of thinking through what this looks like, how we would assess different types of projects like storm damage, resurfacing, and other things that CDI is engaged in. Um, so we're really interested in your feedback and thoughts and any concerns you may have um, regarding this. And we have not tested the tool yet, which we plan to do on projects to see what it would actually spit out. And then we might make adjustments. Um, so as you know, um, the county's trans transportation network is facing really an unprecedented strain due to all of our dis climate driven disasters and other extreme weather events caused by climate change, as well as we have just a huge amount of aging infrastructure. Over the past several years, hundreds of millions of dollars has been spent in the county on fixing our roads due to our resource constraints. Um, the purpose of this tool is to help guide the county in the face of these challenges and to provide additional information to help shape budget and capital improvement program recommendations because of our scarce county re resources and dollars. So the model being drafted, um, we intended it to be comprehensive, systematic, transparent, and backed by data. This would be information to help with your decision making. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Lana to talk about the tool. Good afternoon, board. My name is Lana Martinez-Davis, and then, as said, I'm a senior analyst in the County Administrative Office. Um, currently the project uh, to be evaluated using the tools Oh, I'm sorry, the, here we go. Currently transportation projects to be evaluated using this tool include bridges, culvert replacement, storm damage repair, 
resurfacing, safety improvements, other transportation capital projects. Um, staff is still testing the feasibility of evaluating all these projects together and adjustments may meet, need to be made as we gain more experience. Uh, the tool is not meant to evaluate core maintenance work such as roadside vegetation control and ditch cleaning, minor road surface treatments, amongst others. The tool consists of weighted major categories, each with weighted subfactors. Each subfactor has an associated data set that can be used to judge the subfactor. Currently, the foundation of the tool has been built with six major categories. They are safety and collisions, system performance and preservation, financial impact, equity and public health, access for all, and alignment with county plans. <clears throat> Some example subfactors and their associated data sets are on the screen now. Under the system performance and preservation major category, the subfactor of pavement condition could utilize the county's PCI information as seen in the picture to the right. For the crash prevalence subfactor under the safety and collisions major category, UC Berkeley's Transportation in Injury Mapping System, or TIMS, could be used. Also under the Safety and Collisions Major Category, the Climate Adaptation Vulnerability Assessment recently presented to the RCT, RCT, RTC, excuse me, is being considered under the Geographic Vulnerable Areas Subfactor. And lastly, under the Equity Subfactor, with the Equity and Public Health Major Category, staff is excited to learn about a transportation-specific equity tool created by Caltrans called the Caltrans Equity Index. Oh, sorry. Many of the data sets being considered are spatially based. Staff is hoping to create a model where all data sets can be combined, making the use of the tool more efficient and allowing staff to proactively identify areas to prioritize. Staff continues to develop and test the model um, and anticipates returning December 10th with a completed draft for board consideration and feedback. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Steve. Thank you, Lana. Okay, I'm going to talk about a little bit about some of the ongoing storm damage efforts that we're undertaking um, this year, uh, both from resulting from 23 storm events and also 24. Um, so before you, um, you have some photos of Paulson Road. Paulson Road was flooded for a good four to six months this year um, due to the ongoing storms that we had this winter um, and the fact that actually there's some drainage problems uh, with the channels in that area. So the photos that you have show what the road kind of looked like uh, throughout this winter and into the spring this year. It was unpassable um, and was closed to the public. Next slide, please. However, once the water alleviated um, in June, the road crews were able to get out there and, and actually um, patch some of the worst areas. I will say the road kind of got destroyed in some areas. Um, you know, both from the water standing for so very long and also from vehicles, uh, you know, surpa surpassing our um, our closure out there. And, you know, again, the weight and the water uh, has caused damage to the road. Okay, the next slide, please. So I have a series of air photos here for you. We actually have a really good historical record of this area. And so just to orient you, um, you have Paulson Road going across the page um, from east to west there um, on the bottom. And then you've got the, the creek, which is the main creek. That's actually Green Valley Creek. It says Stream 512, um, basically running north-south. Um, when once, once that creek actually passes Paulson Road, it goes into the College Lake area. Um, this whole area used to be managed sediment-wise uh, quite actively from season to season um, by the farmers out there and also by the road crew. Um, but what you'll see in, in 1948... Uh, the stream had no problem making it through. Um, you would see a couple fields there that, that look like they're left fallow, getting ready possibly to plant. Um, but we don't think there was any levees that existed on that creek at that time in 1948. Now, fast forward to almost 10 years later in 1956, uh, we think a series of private levees had been built for the purpose of reclaiming that land to farm. And you can see that there's some active farming going on one side, at least of of the creek there. And um, what this shows in 1956 is that we did have a, a very fairly large avulsion where the creek went out of its bank and is running through the fields there on the left-hand side of the creek. Okay, the next stream, uh, next photos. Thank you. So now fast forward all the way to today, um, you know, some, you know, 70 years later, um, this is what it looks like. And what it looked like in 2022, um, what you can see there is there was actually an avulsion that went to the other side, went to the right side of the creek. Um, that actually happened in 2017, and this was a series of private levees that had been built by the farmers over the decades 
uh, which now are very difficult to repair due to all the environmental constraints in this area. Um, we have endangered species, steelhead fish, and so forth up and down this channel. And so to rep repair levees uh, for a private farmer is a, is a lengthy, very expensive process. So we see that that breach there hadn't been repaired. And then, pardon me, by the time 2023 came around, which is the air photo on your right-hand side, another very big water year for us, we had two more evulsions occur um, on the left-hand side of the channel there. One at the top where you can see there's some farming and hoop houses going, so there's a big evulsion there. And then one at the bottom, which looks like a riparian area now because that has now become basically what um, Green Valley Creek is. It, it comes across the farmland there, and now it wants to go across Paulson Road and into the College Lake area, which used to be heavily managed um, from a sediment standpoint by the Reclamation District and hasn't been for some time now. And so the water really doesn't have a lot of areas to go. And what ha ends up happening now on a seasonal basis is Paulson Road is flooded. And I think we can anticipate until um, there's some type of uh, either a road raise project or major levee repairs and sediment management done by the farmers in that area. I think we can expect to see Paulson Road flooded for three to six months out of every average winter. Um, and so in thinking this through, Public Works is um, come up with an idea then the next slide, please, um, for what we think might be a more permanent solution for Paulson Road so we can keep it serviceable, serviceable for most months out of the year. And that's really just to raise the entire road in this area for three to five feet. Um, we'll still have water around the road. We're still going to see, you know, a lot of, you know, as the storms come in every winter, um, we'll still see a lot of flooding in the fields and, and so forth. But if we raise the road up about three to five feet and we put in a couple, like, large volume um, culverts, you know, we think that we can keep the road, like I said, at least open for, for most part of the year. Um, now, unfortunately, this is a very expensive endeavor. It's, we think it's going to be at least three million, three to $4 million, probably a large earthen fill type of a project. Very complex from a permanent standpoint, again, because we are really close to riparian areas. Um, and so it'll have to be a full design bid permitted type of project that could take a number of years to develop. So we're looking for funding to do that. And we think this is the ultimate fix. Um, in the meantime, we will be returning to your report within the next couple months um, to uh, request authority for seasonal closures. Um, we think we need to formalize it at this point. You know, it's been done by the road crew as needed, but at this point, I think we can expect that to happen till we can get a more permanent repair in place. Next slide, please. Okay, so moving on to Mount Charlie Road, um, as your board knows, uh, Public Works um, broke ground on a temporary fix to Mount Charlie uh, just to reconnect the road that was destroyed this past winter by a gigantic landslide. Um, so we've been moving along really nicely on that. Um, we're several weeks into construction, um, and you can see all the work that we've completed to date, including clearing out the whole area, uh, getting rid of all the debris. Um, installing a bunch of drainage and then starting to grade and start to build the road up with reinf a reinforced earth fill. Um, only about another week to week and a half left in construction, and we are very hopeful we will have that road open to traffic, um, slow, very slow, five-mile-an-hour traffic. It'll be a one-lane road, um, but we're hoping with the next couple weeks that this road will be open. Next slide, please. Okay, now moving on to more of the central part of the county. Um, this is Schulte's. Uh, this is another location where the road was completely closed due to storm damage. Um, we felt very important to try and get this thing open as access to the area is very limited. So we began working on this culvert replacement a couple weeks ago, and they're actually substantially done. They're about probably 80% done. This photo was taken last week. I think the wall's actually been poured this week. Um, and once we get that wall poured and stripped, we're able to get the road backfilled. We'll be able to open this thing up. We're hoping in the next couple of weeks as well. Uh, next slide, please. And this is Stetson Road, and I think this is going to be the last major project that we go after this summer. Um, it's another storm damage repair in an area that also has very limited access. Uh, we felt this was another very high priority to go after as well. Now, we haven't started construction yet. We're still waiting for a few final permits to come in, environmental permits, but we're working with those agencies very closely. We anticipate having the permits within the next couple of weeks. It'll be the same contractor who's finishing up on Schulte's, who then bounces over to Stetson. It's in the same area of the county, and we'll begin rebuilding this area, which is a failed crib wall, and it involves a fairly large size culvert as well. 
Okay, and what I will say is, is with that, um, this actually takes care of four out of the eight permanently closed roads that we had uh, resulting from storm damage. So when we came to your board in May and we did our budget presentation at that time, eight roads were completely closed. Um, and so this, uh, these four projects constitute four of those. And so we're happy to say that at least we got to, you know, four of, four of these major closures before uh, the ensuing winter rains. Um, but what it does do, and the next slide, please, is it really brings up, um, you know, what we all know is, is coming, which is this winter. Uh, and, you know, we've still got a lot of storm damage projects out there that are unrepaired. Um, we've done our, we'll do our best to winterize them. Um, every year we go out, we freshen up the, the visqueen and the plastic and the, you know, um, and the berms that we have around here to try to redirect water away from these sites, but they're still very vulnerable to further damage should we start getting a, a series of intense storms. With that, going into this winter with little to no contingency in the road fund, as you're all aware, um, with all the big spending that we had to do to recover from the 23 event, um, we were very concerned that we don't have any contingents moving into this winter. And so with that, um, we are um, recommending in concept to hold back the $1 million in allocation for roads through the Measure K. Um, and this will be, again, further expanded upon, I think, in the next item. Um, but this is going to be part of our recommendation today that, that we do hold that money for contingency should any type of um, need arise this winter. Okay, next slide. Okay, so with that, what you have before you today, the recommended actions are to accept and file this status report on transportation project um, prioritization tool to approve in concept um, an emergency road repair contingency of $1 million from Measure K and to direct staff to return on or before December 10th this year with the proposed transportation project prioritization tool as part of a study session with your board. So, and with that, we're happy to take any questions you may have. <laughs> All right, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, I'd like to start by seeing if there's any member of the public who'd like to speak to us on this item. If so, you can please approach the podium. You'll have two minutes. Seeing none here in chambers, is there any member of the public online that would like to speak to us on this item? We don't have any speakers online, Chair. Okay, well, I'll bring it back to the board to see if there's any questions or comments. Supervisor Friend. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm supportive of the Measure K component, but I'll recognize we'll have a greater discussion on that in our next board item. But I do have some pretty significant reservations about the, the tool as it's currently being presented. There's sort of a lot of unanswered questions, and I think that it will lead to a lot of unintended consequences. So I wanted to make sure that we kind of go through some of those things right now so I can uh, either feel more comfortable with it or I actually think that there needs to be a modification of how it's applied. I'll start with just in the May discussion and the follow-up discussion, the board item that came from the CAO's office after, after that discussion, and I could be the only person that actually believes this from the board, but I was under the impression that this, this tool or this discussion was specific to storm damage repair because that's the discussion that we were having where there already was a metric. And there was a discussion at that time uh, from my colleague in the fourth district about adding an equity lens into it and in particular um, how to get Polson funded, but not to apply it to the entire broad, uh, the entire road program functionally. And, and I think that that... Um, is going to be challenging in a number of ways. I mean, first, and I, this is just sort of a basic question. I, I probably best for you, actually, Director Wiesner, or Assistant Director Wiesner. I imagine it's a lot of work um, to have to score every single road and project. I don't know how projects are defined. It's not defined in this in this board letter, and I know that this is still a framework, but I'm concerned that frameworks become policy faster than they don't, and so I want to get to it now. Is is it a reasonable assumption that it would be a lot of work to apply this to the entire set of funding and, and road projects that the county would do for public works? It'll definitely be some effort. Um, we know we're already doing this for the storm damage repair projects that we have on the books. And um, so probably just a little bit more than that. Um, and one thing I can say is in discussions and development of the criteria and the tool, we're really trying to make this user friendly. We're trying to make it geographic based, very data driven, something that you can go to say like a GIS layer, you know, put it, you know, location where your project is and you'll be able to get a lot of the criteria based on that. So I, I'm hoping that a lot of the work will be in development of the tool so that it's much more user friendly for staff. I mean, I think it's appropriate to use this for storm damage repair, in particular for declared disasters, I think, because I think there's a, there, that's in that situation, you have a lot less funding. There's an emergency need. You're choosing between various emergency needs, but not for the overall 
funding process like Measure D or SB1 once SB1 actually shakes out to not just be storm damage repair because some of these factors don't seem to be relevant. I mean, I think about the Measure D road resurfacing program and I think about uh, the decisions I've made, for example, in my own district. It's for local roads, it's for residential roads. That's the primary purpose of what it's for. Um, there aren't a lot of safety or collision based factors on a residential road. There aren't uh, there aren't really access for all our public health or equity necessarily components to a residential road. And if we're if we're uplifting PCI, by definition, roads with lower PCI would have a higher cost for repair. So if I'm elevating that, then I'm going to be doing less roads, ro less road miles than I would otherwise. Um, and what I don't want is a tool that's basically leading the board or leading actually staff and then the board for doing less roads overall. And I don't see how data wise this this couldn't this wouldn't do that. Am I correct in thinking that? I mean, lower PCI does lead to higher cost of repair, correct, for on a per mile basis for road repair? That's true, yeah. And so, and part of our broader PCI factor is that's an average across all of the roads. I mean, there's an, each individual road has a PCI, a pavement condition index. I should be specific to anybody, the two people listening at home on this. But if we were to do less roads, um, even those with lower PCI, then the overall network would probably drop from an overall pavement condition index component as well, correct? Yeah. There would be a tipping point number of when just repairing the worst roads may actually bring down the overall PCI of the overall county road network. That could be. It. I mean, it's true that pavement management theory will will lead one um, to to put money into roads that are in halfway decent shape as opposed to, you know, more miles of that as opposed to a road that's completely failed and just repairing one road. Okay. Yeah. Obviously, there's an element that hasn't been defined of how these will be weighted, how it'll be applied, et cetera. And I think, I mean, that's a fair statement. But I, I just have a concern that it would be used at all for anything beyond the emergency repairs. I mean, we had a system for emergency repair prioritization. I think it's very reasonable that my colleague wanted also to be an equity lens of that. Um, and I think that that's what this should be narrowed down to. I think that applying it to the entirety of the network, the entirety of the funding would actually have unintended consequences for how we're currently doing roads. I think that because there's sort of, I mean, I think the goal of the board and, and the pretty significant discussion that was had about road funding at that time was to do more roads this doesn't i don't see this tool wouldn't do that this tool would would try and choose between roads but i think that the only way that it could do that is actually by uh either irrespective of the geographic goal that you're talking about that's not built into the factor here necessarily that's what we currently do is seeking a geographic distribution of, of road funding across uh both on road miles and across all the districts um Using this tool, though, it may actually geographically isolate some of the projects. Has, that could be an unintended consequence. I mean, the board can still do whatever it wants, but now you've got a quote-unquote data-driven tool that's making it that's making that decision harder for a future board than I think would be otherwise. Um, and I think that's exceptionally acute in Measure D, but I think it could be acute in anything other than emergency repairs. So my recommendation would be that this the study the focus of this tool should be how it applies specifically to um, emergency or storm damage repairs, or I would say even federally declared disaster repairs, which is where all this discussion is really coming from. And again, that's what I thought the board was actually getting at this discussion. I didn't think it was for everything. Um, to narrow it down and to see if it works in that component, I, I think that it's it's too broad under this situation. It could be just unintended and problematic. That's, that's going to be uh, my recommendation for this moving forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, first, I want to appreciate the work being done on Schultes and Stetson. Um, those are uh, vital repair projects to ensure that people will continue to be able to get to and from their home in the in the future. And so um, I know there's a lot of people who are very relieved that those projects are moving forward. And it was it was un unclear, right, uh, because the funding situation is so tenuous. Um, and so we've had to go back and forth with those residents quite a bit. Um, so really positive that we are getting those repairs done. Um, it's a good step in the right direction that I think we're putting this 1 million in Measure K towards con contingencies this winter. Um, of course, it's, um, you know, it, I think we have to look at it 
in context of you know all the contingency funds, which we'll discuss more in the in the next item, um, because uh, we you know certainly need you know it seems like at least one point five million you know for a for an average winter. Um, uh, I share some of the concerns that Supervisor Friend has brought up as far as trying to uh, create a, a formula for all of our road investments. Um, you know, to be honest, what this kind of reminds me of is the core discussion where, um, you know, we have a somewhat opaque uh, process, at least to the board, uh, determining, you know, telling us what we should invest limited funds in. And then sometimes we get those results back and, you know, are not always on the same page as far as uh, that, that those are actually the ones we want to move forward with. And so I'm not sure that we really want to, uh, you know, create more complexity uh, where it's not needed. Um, you know, I think when we had this discussion in May, uh, my biggest interest was just to see the short list of projects where some additional investment would ultimately save us the most money in the long term, right? I mean, what are the culverts that if they blow out are going to cost us the most then in additional repairs? Where could preventative maintenance go the furthest? Um, so that's kind of really at the core of of what I would like to see in the outcomes of any you know study of our road network. Supervisor person. Yeah, I I appreciate the fine tune. I think uh, a prioritization tool to ensure we focus resources on our emergency responses is that are based on data, social equity, uh, safety is really where we need to go. As was was mentioned, um, you know I. Thank you for the to updating this and trying to get a focus on what we're doing to make some improvements to our roads that have been just slaughtered since uh uh well for the last eight or ten years and when we passed measure d uh we became you know a so called self help county because we we pass a, a tax measure to help do our roads so we could get federal and state money and s b one Senate bill one came on uh so we could get a good match um but that hasn't been the clearly hasn't been enough and we can't do it all so that's where i think we should try to focus our attention at this point supervisor Hernandez. so i think that staff is just barely beginning the work on this prior prioritization tool um for me i think it's our equity statement coming into fruition i think the policy changes align with the efforts to ensure equitable distribution of county resources across all the county, addressing historical funding inequities. I think these changes are similar to those that were advocated for equitable flood protection for disadvantaged communities such as Watsonville, Pajaro. I think a proposal which was approved by the Board of Supervisors and the National Association of Counties, which called for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to revise its cost-benefit analysis, ensuring areas like Watsonville receive federal funding by considering economic factors such as agricultural impacts that make projects in poor communities eligible for funding. The policy promotes fairness by prioritizing historically underserved communities, focusing on climate resilience, using transparent data-driven criteria, decision-making, tools like the Caltrans Equity Index and Climate Adaptation Vulnerability Assessment ensure resources are allocated to areas with the greatest need. By addressing public health and accessibility, the policy ensures safer, more reliable transportation for all. It also maximizes the use of scarce resources, supporting both routine and emergency infrastructure projects, the policy's flexibility and alignment with the county and statewide goals such as SB1 make it a comprehensive approach to infrastructure development. You know, I, I think that this is basically aligning with a lot of the changes that have happened at the federal, state, and a lot of local jurisdictions that they're moving towards a more equitable approach to planning, transportation, and infrastructure structure projects. You know, like I mentioned before, even our own Paro Levy project uh, wouldn't have happened both at the state and federal level had it not been for changes in the prioritization process. By utilizing the lens of equity, all we're doing is simply acknowledging the past lack of investments in certain parts of the county. 
And I think that that's what equity is about. Um, but it'd be, you know, if we can move with the, with the measure K and emergency money, I'd be fine as a pilot project. But like I said before, we're barely beginning this process. Staff is barely looking into this process of a, of coming up with a prioritization tool. So I think we're at the beginning stages. So, Chair Cummings, if I could uh, add something. Uh, one of the dilemmas we're facing, um, I, and I get it that, you know, applying uh, a prioritization tool to the storm damage is certainly a, a step forward, I think, because we've been struggling with how to rank all these hundreds of projects we have and which ones, you know, do you put first and then which ones do you put last and, and decisions have to be made. But what's interesting to me is that I realized looking at historical patterns is that we're spending a big chunk of our money on emergency repairs not on maintenance and not on other projects. So Sarah Christensen came to meet with me this week. She's the new executive director of RTC, and she was advocating for the Soquel multimodal project uh, that Supervisor Friend um, has championed long. And um, what they need is the last phase of that, which is from uh, State Park Drive to Freedom Boulevard. And it's basically carrying all the project forward, right? So bike lanes, uh, sidewalks, uh, uh, ADA, uh, pedestrian crossings, all that. And so she says, we need approximately $3 million from the county, and we're going to leverage somewhere around 18 to 20 million. And so to me, I go, gosh, this SoCal Drive, hundreds of thousands of people use that road all the time, right? I mean, I, it's a major artery. But how do I take rank that $3 million against all these storm drain projects? I mean, we're ultimately we're making a choice. We're saying we're gonna storm, we're gonna rank the storm drain, these storm um repair projects over a project like that. That's what we've been doing as a county. As I we, inadvertently, but it's just because of the emergency, we've been just responding, responding. And so um you know, how do I, ultimately it's the use of road funds, but it ultimately can be some general fund, right? Because we're proposing to put some measure K money in to, which is general fund money, but we're also proposing to put some in the contingencies, which could be used for roads as well. Um, there's some, so ultimately you're going to be, we're prioritizing, prior, prioritizing general fund money. And right now, under the existing direction, we have this huge hole in storm repair projects. So the money goes all that way. But then you have a project like this, and this is ultimately the dilemma with climate change, is that projects like this SoCal multimodal, which affects a lot more people than most of these storm repair projects. Many of these storm repair projects, you may be impacting a community of 50 people, 100 people. There's one project I can think of that has about 200 people. That's about $10 million. And we can't spend $3 million to, for like 100,000 people who use SoCal. I mean, I was just dilemma when I was talking to Sarah about this. I was just like, gosh, how do we do that? So part of it is trying to put a, a structure into how we make decisions overall. That's why we were trying to explore uh, this idea. I know Supervisor Hernandez has been, every time I meet with him, he's talking about this. But it, I also thought about it in terms of our struggle, in terms of how we're ranking projects overall using scarce county dollars right now because of the emergencies um they are being ranked number one and but yet at some point we realize these emergencies are going to be ongoing they're becoming the this is the normal now and so uh, th does that mean we never a project like socal never becomes number one when we're talking about measure k or measure or some of our road funds so anyway that's part of what we were trying to get at here and I agree that it's con it's con it's complex. We start going into Measure D and all that other stuff, but we're trying to look at the overall picture and how do you rank these projects? Is there? I mean, from a gut feel, I can use my gut and say, "Gosh, it makes more sense to spend three million dollars on Soquel than on three million dollars towards another of the hundred storm repair projects." But on the other hand, I don't have a tool for that per se. Yeah, Mr. Chair, um, I. Oh, shoot. Let me just take a stack. So I got Zach, I got Felipe, I got Mono, and then I got Bruce. I mean, I appreciate the comments, but 
Mr. Palacios, but I actually don't, even under that scenario, and this is a project in my district that I advocated to the CTC for, for multiple meetings. The reason we don't have the money, by the way, is because they overspend on the other section of SoCal and then these other elements we've had. So it's not, it's not a perfectly clean comparison that we're choosing storm drains over it. This was money that we could have had, but for these other costs on the other section of, of SoCal. But even under the evaluative tool that we have right here, I actually couldn't guarantee you that this would get ranked number one. When you look at these criteria, uh, that's not an area of safety and collisions. That's not an area. That it, actually, the PCI is fine in that section. I don't on the public health and equity. It is an access for all question. My point is, is that I think that, and what Sarah had asked us for was using our Measure D funds for it, which then eliminates the local road component. Which means I'm taking money from the third district, the fifth district, the fourth district. The only way to do it would be for me to take or the first district. I mean, that's where all that money would come from. I think that the my concern is, is that. Once you apply this tool, and it's not arbitrary, but it it preferences certain things to a network that isn't uniform. I mean, when you when you standardize something that's not standardizable, both in funding streams or conditions, be it in the mountains or the ocean or be it in the whatever, then I think that you create unintended consequences. And Matthew wouldn't do this. You can't standardize this. So in the situation you're talking about, that sounds like something that would be responsible for the CDI or you to bring forward and say, hey, we've got this opportunity. This isn't a prioritization tool. You can say, this is a great project. Are you willing to deprioritize storm drain projects for one year in exchange for this? And then it's a board decision. Um, I mean, I wasn't aware that that was an option. None of the discussion I've had with CDI or RTC presented it that way. I'll just assure you that. It was that there's no money, you know, in that case. So I'm just saying that that not it was a prioritization component that the board could decide. It was that it was either use measure D money or not. I don't even have enough money in my district to even consider it. It's 1.2 a year. I mean, I'm not going to do three. So I'm just saying that that sound, you already, I feel like we already have that authority to come forward and give us those choices. This, I just think that applying this tool across everything is going to fundamentally shift. Um, I think it's going to, all I can say is it's going to have unintended consequences and we'll do less roads than we want. I think it makes sense on storm damage. I agree it's a larger proportion, but I think that's where the real fights are really occurring right now is how do you prioritize these emergency closures and emergency openings with limited money on federal declarations? And this would help provide clarity or uniformity on that subset. Supervisor Hernandez. You know, I just, but the other thing I wanted to mention uh, is I, I wanted to thank also staff for Paulson Road. Um, it, Paulson Road is like a perfect example, right? Uh, I've driven probably almost 35 years that I've driven. You know, I've driven that road and Paulson has not been adequately addressed in those 35 years. You know, had it been another road that had that seasonal problem in another part of the county, I believe it would have been a, had a permanent uh, fix and a permanent fix would have been brought forward, but it's been allowed to continue. And I don't know how much money had been put in to address fixing the road over the years dur during those seasons, but I bet that that amount of money, there could have been a permanent fix for the amount of money that we've been fixing the roads. And, you know, that's what I mean by you know, investments in those areas. And I think that, you know, when you look at those four roads, right, that were fixed out of the eight roads, I think Paulson's probably the only one that's been that way for like 40, 50 years, 1956. And so that's why I want to make sure that we can address these issues. You know, um, otherwise, it, you know, Paulson's like my mini, um, or a river, you know, it's something that's been going on since the, since the 50s. So that, that's why I think it's a powerful tool. It's a tool that addresses these issues that stand out. Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair, uh, and thank you, CAO Palacios, for that example. I mean, certainly I would agree that uh, the SoCal Drive project uh, is incredibly important, especially because we have the opportunity uh, to pull down some some significant uh, state funding for that project. And so anything that we can contribute to, um, you know, the design work there to prepare that project for a grant application uh, is extremely important. And, of course, if, you know, the whole um, 
phase three of the Highway One project sort of hinges on that as well. So there's a lot wrapped up into it. Um, I mean, as you were talking about it and sort of like, geez, what would the uh, the way to evaluate all these projects be? I mean, it, it made me think of something that, you know, as we we're talking about these six categories occurred to me as well, which is like, well, actually there is a shorthand for this which is the economic impact, right? I mean, I think that you could look at, you know, for, uh, what is the, you know, whether it's the value of all the homes in a specific area, um, they have access via a certain road versus the, you know, the, the value of everyone's time, um, you know, from delays on uh, SoCal Drive or the, the improvements that that would lead to. Um, I mean, that is the lowest common denominator. And of course, then it gets back to the other primary metric we have when it comes to road, which is usage. Right. I mean, the more people that use a road, the more economic impact uh, its availability has. And so I wonder if there's not just a way that we can actually simplify um, our our evaluation tool by just looking at the economics of the situation. Um, and of course, you know, this gets, you know, we're, we're sort of talking about, you know, the tough choices here about how do we divide up a very limited pool of funding. But, you know, this gets back to the larger uh, county budget discussion, which is, you know, what services do people value from the county the most? I mean, um, and I think this is a, a big problem with trying to, um, you know, ultimately say that we're not going to uh, invest in any particular road because, you know, we've just, like, we have consistently invested in services in this community more than infrastructure. I mean, and that's a choice that we've had to make in many ways because of our difficult budget situation. But when someone's road goes out, well, then we have it's time to pay the piper on the infrastructure. Um, and so, I mean, it, it's probably worth looking at you know, the list of projects that we need to do, whether that's emergency repair or proactively um, you know, before we pass a budget every year to say, okay, look, realistically, if we allocate more money to roads, this is what we can do. If we allocate this amount, it's going to be just these ones. So, Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, Mike. We obviously can't do everything we want to do with what we have. Um, and I just, um, I think that a specific tool will tie our hands. Uh, I think that's what uh, Supervisor Friend is saying. And I'm, well, I know the critical need for SoCal Drive Avenue too as, as well, but I think this might just tie our hands too much. I just want to appreciate uh, the staff presentation for all your work on this. Um, I, I have mixed feelings on on this whole item because I, I see two issues that I think it has been reflected in kind of the comments that we've heard from the board members. One is that, you know, when one is the priority prioritization of emergency repairs, which I think, you know, really came up um, not only last winter, but this winter as well with, you know, certain roads going out. And then it's like, okay, well, where do we spend our money on these really critical um, repairs that we need to make? And then the other is this issue of how do we prioritize ongoing maintenance and upgrades to some of the roads within our communities? And then there's a lot of these you know, equity factors, danger factors, how much people are using them, you know, the monetarily, how much they're bringing in, you know, potentially revenue, I guess. And so it, it's, so I, I guess kind of where I'm at is really trying to reconcile those two different issues and prioritization, because as we continue to be faced with disasters year after year, we need to start thinking about, well, you know, given if we were have to have a storm of X magnitude, which roads will we would likely go out or which roads have we been neglecting for a long period of time? And should we be focusing on those? And then you have just the ones that have gone out and it's like, okay, well, which ones do we pick in terms of, do we want to repair? We leave them closed for X amount of years. And so um, I don't have the magic bullet for this one, unfortunately. Um, but um, I don't want to do anything to, to what to my colleagues have said is, is tie our hands. And so, um, I'm not sure the best way to bring that piece of this back to our board, but um, um, I think that, you know, if the if the idea is that there would be a study session in December that would, you know, bring us options back, maybe that's an opportunity for us to explore, you know, which path we want to go down, unless we just decide that we don't want to, you know, explore either of these prioritization tools at this point in time, or just focus on emergency. So, um, It'll be good to hear from other board members, but um, that's kind of what I'm what I'm gathering from this 
um, conversation is that there's some concerns and those two prioritization kind of options are really what's before us unless we want to, you know, either, it, it seems like if we combine them, um, it's going to make it a lot trickier. Um, but if there's a way to separate those two out, it will really try to get to kind of, I think, what folks are seeing as as um, as priorities. And then I will say that I actually did have a question regarding the um, Measure K funds. Um, I'm supportive of that just because of how much we've been um, getting impacted over the past few years. I do want to ask, though, if we were to have a mellow winter what would that mean in terms of those that million dollar contingency moving forward? Um, our intent was um, if there are Measure K uh, contingency funds that are not spent this winter, uh, that we would uh, prioritize spending them on our road projects and specifically our emergency repair projects that we have, the list of projects we have. But that's going to be a board decision. So we were going to come back in uh, after the winter and our intent, though, is to prioritize that money, that contingency money for road expenditures. Have the board direct us about how you would like to spend those dollars. Okay. All right, Supervisor Hernandez. So I'd be open to, you know, sort of like a pilot project, uh, taking uh, Supervisor Friend's uh, comments about making it a, a project for emergency projects, the, prior to, the prioritization tool, using it for... Um, the emergency projects that we have. I'm, I'm in agreement with that. I don't know if it's a pilot or not. I, I was just thinking just it would be narrowly applied to that. Um, and so when you come, if we, I don't know if you need a study session for that or not. I mean, at the end of the day, you have a prioritization tool. This is functionally adding a new and additional lens onto that. But I mean, if. Yeah, can I, yeah. so I think for the, if you want to limit it just to the emergency projects, we could take that direction. I would think the study session in December would allow you to see how it works with all the categories, subcategories, and weighting. So if you're interested in that component and weighing in before we finalize it and actually use it for decisions with the 25-26 budget, then I would say we would keep that report back. I want to, I mean, my interest would be to see how it's going to be, it, it, okay, how it would apply to storm, because we're going to get a million questions during the storms alone. And so I would still like to maintain that if we do a study session, it's how it would be applied to emergency repair specifically, not the broader network. Correct. Yeah, okay. it would just be emergency storm repair projects. Okay, then I would. If you're comfortable with this, uh, Supervisor Hernandez, I'll move the recommended actions with the additional direction that the study session on, on or before December 10th uh, be focused on, well, it doesn't have to just be storm damage, but emergency repairs, because there's obviously repairs that are associated with that. Second. Okay. So I like, sir, so sir, 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 sir. yeah, I, I understand what my colleagues are getting at. I'm just, I, I, in some ways, I think it's worth returning to Carlos's point here, which is like, we do need to consider the the emergency repairs in the context of everything else, right? The capacity or just uh, you know quality projects like SoCal Drive, but also, I mean, proactive maintenance, right? I mean, is it better to do an emergency project on a road that's washed out that serves 15 people, or proactively replace a culvert, a culvert that, if it washed out, uh, you know, would leave. 500 people stranded, right? And so I feel like if we're looking at this in isolation, it might deprive us of the opportunity to, to more comprehensively consider these kinds of investments. I can, under I can understand that. Um, I'm trying to think of a way that we could still harmonize that. As I had said, based on the CAO's comments, I feel that the opportunity currently exists for you to bring forward projects that you would recommend vis-a-vis -vis other projects. I mean, I didn't because we have CIPs, we have five-year measure Ds, but if something pops up, then that should be, but how, but applying a tool to each one of those individual things, I think is problematic. But I mean, in regards to like the SoCal, which I think is actually an outlier project, this doesn't come up. I mean, this is a once in a generational opportunity that we receive that funding. We can also be honest about that. So it's a good example, but it's also never gonna literally happen again on any of our 10 years. But in regards to what you're talking about, the question would be as part of the study session is should, another factor be 
how we proactively invest in projects that could become emergency related projects, I think is is a reasonable question. Or maybe that's a seventh evaluative tool of awaiting um, that isn't currently being considered, which is, I don't know if it's really ROI, but it's something of, of functionally what you've been saying is that a savings to the network moving forward to make this investment. Maybe that counts under the financial line. It was not fully defined um, to me, but um, if you feel like it is, then maybe that's something that we could be just more specifically as one of the evaluative tools that are currently in that. So maybe if I can ask for a point of clarification, not really a point of clarification, but maybe, you know, it sounds like um, there is a desire for there to be a prioritization tool specific for emergency repairs. And I'm wondering if there could also be some kind of study session on, you know, how we be prioritizing road maintenance and upgrades in general and have them be two separate things. So we're not, again, we're not kind of lumping all of them together because it sounds like there's a, a strong desire to, to focus on emergency repairs, but then there's also a desire and recognition that some of the roads in our community, we, we need to be thinking about them as well. And, you know, how we prioritize them in the past, maybe that's not the best way we should be doing it. And maybe there's an opportunity for us to refine that process and bring that forward as well. And so rather than it being, you know, one option, we're bringing forward multiple ways of kind of looking at roads throughout the county. And so I'm just wondering, because I'm trying to get to some of the concerns I hear coming from Supervisor Koenig and trying to marry them with this desire to really, you know, also um, focus on emergency repairs. Hey, Chair Cummings, it uh, sounds like those are two separate tools um, or frameworks. And I would say that it's going to be um, our efforts are going to be really focused on this emergency repair tool. But what we can do is we're defining and kind of zeroing in on what we're going to use. Maybe we can discuss options for considering projects outside outside of that. Um, I don't think we're going to have a whole second tool by December 10th, but if you want us to think through and maybe provide some preliminary options that aren't necessarily tied to a tool, we can try to do that. Okay. Sounds good. Okay, so it sounds like the um, what's going to come back in this study session of where the prioritization is going to be is really focused on emergency repairs and then we can have ongoing discussions about how we can um, look at road maintenance and upgrades moving forward. But the work that will be conducted between now and that December 10th meeting is going to really focus on prioritization of emergency repairs. If, that, if I hear that correctly from you all. Correct. Okay. All right. With that, um, look forward to the ongoing conversation about this. Um, I mean, I've heard from um, Supervisor Koenig and, and others that you know, roads are really critical and really trying to get to some of the deferred maintenance is something that the board really wants to see happen. But at this point in time, as we're going to move into that study session, we're really going to focus on the prioritization of emergency repairs. And so with that, I just want to thank you all again for um, the presentation. Thank my colleagues for their input. And I'll ask the clerk for a roll call vote on this item. Could you restate the motion, please? Yes. It's for the recommended actions, but it's just narrowing the December 10th or earlier come back for on storm damage repairs with an understanding that I think from Supervisor Koenig that the financial component be a, a broader explanation as to how that will be applied. Just point of clarification, just emergency repairs. Yes, I'm, I'm sorry. I used the wrong term. Yes, emergency repairs. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. McPherson. Aye. And Cummings. Aye. That passes unanimously with the additional direction. Thank you very much. Which leads us to our last item of the day. And so this is item number 13. Consider supplemental report to the adopted budget actions for fiscal year 2024-25. Adopt two resolutions canceling revenue and appropriations in the amount of $7,214,872 through the fiscal year 2024 Measure K spending plan and take related actions. And I'll turn it over to Nicole Colburn uh, and Marcus Pimentel to give the presentation. Hey, good afternoon again, Chair Cummings and members of the board. I'm Nicole Coburn, Assistant CAO. And today I'm joined by Marcus Pimentel, who's the County Budget Manager. So for today's presentation, we're gonna briefly summarize the 2024-25 budget adjustments 
that were included in the adopted budget, or actually both included in the adopted budget and some additional adjustments. We're also going to uh, discuss the status of the five major recent disaster events that we're waiting on FEMA reimbursements for, and we're going to revisit the board approved Measure K priorities and present the Measure K budget and spending plan for this current fiscal year. And I'm going to turn it over to Marcus to talk about the budget first. Thank you, Nicole. Marcus Pimentel, your county budget manager. Um, this is this current slide right here is showing some of the adjustments, the first budget adjustments to the adopted budget you adopted on consent earlier today. So we already have a budget adjustments for, for the 24-25 budget. Um, so the CO board letter that you have in your packet today and that we're presenting, this is effectively the, the recommended actions in the letter is, is on the slide. The rest of the information is additional information that should the board want to uh, have discussions about. But there are three budget amendments coming forward. One is we did get another hit from the state of California, a $259,000 reduction to child support services. At this point in time, we don't have a solution to solve for that other than uh, keeping two of their positions vacant. That's that's their recommendation. It's the department's recommendation is what they prefer to do at this point in time. And while they try to determine if there are other solutions to restore the funding. Um, so that's one of our first budget amendments. <clears throat> These were vacant positions that were not filled. Uh, second, we had a finding by the state of California that reallocates a, a one, we believe it to be a one-time $109,000 of the county sales tax to other agencies in the, in the state of California. We've had conversations about the current sales tax allocation formulas and that it rewards for uh, agencies with fulfillment centers based on online sales. And this is just another example. Um, to, some agencies are getting a portion of our county dollars now sent back to them as a one-time finding. We hope be just a one-time finding by the state of California. So that's a, a loss of $109,000 in our sales tax estimate. And then with the good news, uh, I do want to always remind myself to acknowledge the amazing works of uh, Supervisor Zach Friend in your office, your Chief of Staff, Allison Villalante, all of our congressional representatives, the staff, and Nicole by my by my side, Carlos, Lana. Um, so many folks worked on getting and advocating for the county to get our COVID money. You might remember just a year ago, we were only 17% collected. Um, so we, we, we put a big pressure on on and collective efforts on how we can get FEMA to respond faster, especially on the side of COVID. We've got great news. In in July, um, we received obligations from FEMA, uh, $24 million in excess of our budgeted $14 million we planned to get. So we had welcome news that far exceeded our expectations. And I really thank you, uh, Zach and your and Allison and everybody and all the congressional partners. It was phenomenal news. The downside to that from a budget standpoint is it took away about $7 million we had planned. We thought we were going to get to from a timeline perspective. We got it early. So it was received in last year's budget. So it, it effectively reduces the current year budget. Um, so it's money that I thought we were going to get $14 million in COVID this coming year and then $14 million in the out year. We got almost all of it in July up front. So that's great news, but it does reduce our budget capacity a little bit in this current year. So those are the three budget actions that I have before you. And we have a, a bar chart just to talk about COVID status. Um, while we do have, it's great. I mean, like this, the slide chart looked the opposite. We had a little bit in green and everything else was in red a year ago. So effectively now most of it, we've got cash in the bank. We have 17 million in, in COVID money that came in in July that's obligated. So usually that means within four to six weeks, the cash will show up. Usually the feds are having a budget challenge right now, adopting continuing actions, but we do expect they're approved and we'll see that cash flow. So it leaves about seven, seven and a half million dollars left for us to receive on COVID. So move on to our next slide. So well, since I was, we were talking about COVID, we thought just provide an update on where we're at on all disasters. Um, across all disasters, the county has spent about $253 million and growing a little bit. We haven't closed the books on the 2023 storm costs, and we certainly haven't closed the books on the 24 disaster impacts, not federally declared yet, but that are here. Um, but in total, the county has had to pay out $253 million in disasters since 2017. And, and you know, back in the day, I used to be an accountant, pretend I, and now I pretend I am. Um, my aspect on that is the county certainly spent a lot more than $250 million on disaster spending. You think of COVID alone with our ARPA funding, health services got a lot of direct federal dollars. I mean, we're, we're probably over $500,000 in, in, in response total, but, but the county had to put up front $250 million of our own, own money. 
and then ask for reimbursement, whether it's FEMA or Federal Highway. So um, I, I don't want to pretend that the disasters only cost us $250 million or other costs that recover other ways. Um, but because of the, the recent work with, with the COVID reimbursements, collectively, we're only 27% left on all these disasters are still in FEMA land um, waiting. waiting. Federal highways, we're not necessarily concerned about, so we're not reporting on that. They tend to be very responsive, very timely. It's a different system. We've talked about the, the benefits of working with that. So within FEMA, um, we still have about $40 million that are out there that, that are under review. So that's a better story than we were a year ago. So I just want to give you an update on where we're at on, on all of our disasters. Is, can I just interrupt? Is that, are you equating what we thought was almost 100, 100 and now it's 40 or 30 or 40, 39 or 40? Yeah, just just a year ago. Um, it was 100 or 95 or something. Uh, yeah, we were, we, were, we were closer to about 100 million in total that was uncollected. And recent, you know, FEMA's made a lot of progress on 2017. We've now got 2017 effectively fully funded those storms. So COVID has been. I could say that we're still 39 from FEMA. Okay. 39 and then we'll still have some new costs so we, it wouldn't surprise me to see us ultimately have from the 2023 and 2024 another five to ten million maybe of new costs that show up there so 50 million yeah fund. probably about 50 million will be coming through fema um but we're hoping a lot of those storm damage 2023 will end up going through federal highways versus fema but um yeah again there tend to be a better payer and better partner but that was a great memory and good yeah, right. but it's the progress we've made in just over a year. So in the in the actions of the adopted budget, we want, we would just want to talk. These are actions we're action. These are not actions we're talking about with you right now. These are things that are already included in the adopted budget. But we want to spend a little bit more extra time talking about them with the June fourth concluding actions. And again, with the twenty four, technically twenty four point six million of extra FEMA obligations we received in July. That that money was recorded from a timely standpoint as last year's money, and with the recognition of seven point five million dollars in Measure K, we ended up with um, just about thirty million dollars of available resources to allocate. Now a lot of that was already predetermined in the concluding actions when we prioritized if there is available fund balance, how that how that becomes allocated. And there are also discussions when we issued the disaster debt financing in May that we want to prioritize some FEMA dollars to to reducing and, and helping with those disaster costs. So with the seven and a half million for Measure K, with the 24.6 million in excess FEMA revenue, um, we did allocate about $30 million different places. Predominantly, we put starting with 18 million, um, now a net of 11.2 million. We're setting aside in our debt service fund for the disaster financing. So to the extent any of our 2023 storms, if FEMA has a bigger denial rate than we expect, We'll, we want to set a contingency aside so we're not tapping road funds to, to bridge that gap. We want to have a way to go to, to, to resolve any excess denials than we, than we expected. So we want to put $11.2 million in that fund just to protect us as a risk. We also want to recognize there's an opportunity to refinance or effectively lower our borrowing costs on that debt we just issued in May. Some of that is externally financed at a higher interest rate that we can certainly use some. If, if we only need hypothetically five of the $11 million, Maybe six million can go towards reducing some of our debt service. So we want to set aside eleven point two million dollars to protect A against the risk of FEMA denials and B to help us think about how we might lower our debt borrowing costs for, for the disaster debt. Seven point nine million of this was allocated. You might recall we had to almost effectively liquidate our our, our general fund contingency. Typically it's carried at a one percent value. Um we were down to just about a half a million dollars, five hundred thousand dollars at, at June fourth. So this action fully restores it to its one percent contingency, so that the board has some flexibility. Should we have another disaster event, that we have some somewhere to go for some quick. It's that short term um, 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 checking account money that you can go right to if if you need it. Uh, and then allocating Measure K, we've allocated the. That and we'll talk about that in a half second. But we also recognized and, and got a report from our, uh, our risk manager that our property liability fund, due to um, higher higher payouts than expected and more claims than we expected, was down to a 20% funded level. That's that's not a reserve. That means other expected liabilities 
we want to be closer to 100% funded so we can pay everything that's due. They're down to 20%. They can only afford to pay 20% of the projected liability. So um, we are making an advance payment into that fund to increase their cash flow just to make sure that the cash is there when, when payments become due for liabilities. And as you know, we're self-insured for a property liability fund. So ultimately, it's our responsibility to be able to make a payment when they become due. So those are the big actions that were done in the adopted budget and in accordance with the concluding actions and the priority of that. I'm going to talk about the Measure K budget and um, where we've placed it. Um, so you might recall um, this slide from when we brought the measure to the board to uh, place it on the ballot. Um, that was on December 5th of 2023. And at the time, the board both placed the measure on the ballot and approved and established budget priorities for spending Measure K should it pass. Luckily, voters approved the measure during, as part of the presidential primary on March 5th. And the priorities highlighted here are the same as those that we presented back then. Um, this included uh, $4 million in new investments that would cover housing, homelessness, parks, and roads. Um, following that approval of that measure, unfortunately, as you know, um, a lawsuit was filed that had the potential of holding up our ability to both budget the revenue and expense. Um, fortunately, since the last time we updated you it, at, at the beginning of June, we've been able to resolve the lawsuit. And so as a consequence, we've been able to budget both the revenue and expense. And that is what we're here to show you today. Um, so this chart shows you that we've brought in the seven and a half million dollars in Measure K into the 2024-25 budget. This is prorated for the first year of collection because we will start receiving funds um, beginning in October or thereabouts. Um, annually, the Measure K is going to bring ten million dollars into the county starting next fiscal year. So the adopted budget in terms of expenditures, um, all of these are consistent with the board approved priorities that you previously considered in December. Uh, we have a million dollars going into um, the Housing for Health Division for various homeless homelessness programs and services. Um, there are two that they are targeting for helping to fund um, in the unincorporated areas. These would be behavioral health, the behavioral health bridge housing project, and then the youth uh, home key project. Housing for Health intends to track these projects um, tied to the Measure K funding. We also have a million dollars that we've budgeted in the parks capital projects um, budget. And this appears as a transfer in, in the adopted budget. And we'll be working with the board to determine the use of those funds. Um, we've also budgeted five and a half million dollars um, in general fund contingencies. This includes two million dollars that's restricted. And it, those two restrictions are highlighted here. Um, the first restriction is for the emergency road projects that you heard about in the previous item that we'd use on any emergency repairs um, that would pop up this winter when we have storms. Um, the other million dollars in restricted contingencies is for housing related uses. And we've worked with both the health services agency and the human services department, as well as the housing division and CDI to identify some proposed uses. Um, first, within that $1 million, um, we are proposing um, setting aside $200,000 for housing authority security deposits for units rented in unincorporated areas. They are um, without some funding, um, and so we were viewing this as some bridge funding until a new funding cycle comes up for them to apply to um, bring in new funds for this program. Um, there's also $400,000 that the Health Services Agency and Housing for Health um, Department or Division have identified for behavioral health room and board expenses in licensed residential facilities in unincorporated areas. And um, I believe Monica Morales is here should you have questions regarding the, the use of those funds. And lastly, there are is $400,000 for investing <clears throat> in affordable and supportive housing projects in unincorporated areas. And we uh, view this, uh, we didn't 
have uh, the account set up in time, but what would likely happen is that we would transfer these funds from contingencies to CDI housing division to hold and restricted funds for projects that you might identify as a loan or a match or something else related to affordable and supportive housing. Um, so this really is a partnership for these housing related uses between the three departments. Um, they've developed these uh, priorities because they've identified ways to both leverage funds from state and federal sources in the instance of the behavioral health room and board expenses, and then really supporting projects that expand affordable housing opportunities, opportunities for people that live and work in the community, um, as well as um, investing in projects that create really integrated mixed use and mixed income housing opportunities. The remaining three and a half million dollars that you see here is been placed into general fund contingencies um, to restore our 1% budget um, of general fund expenditures. And this really is to help us prepare for this upcoming winter and any other emergencies that we might experience in the coming months. Um, so it really helps us to uh, cover those unbudgeted, unexpected costs. And we, as mentioned previously, we would return to the board should these funds not be spent, we would return and um, come with you with a recommendation for how to use those. So in total, that's seven and a half million dollars from Measure K into the current year budget. And with that, we're happy to answer any questions you have. I thank you very much for that presentation. I'm going to open it up to the public to see if there's any member of the public who'd like to speak to us on this item. If so, please approach the podium. Seeing none, uh, I'm going to see if there's any members of the public online who would like, like to address us on this item. We have no speakers, Chair. Okay. With that, I'll bring it back to the board. Um, I have some questions that I'm happy to ask when um, time comes, but just having worked on this, I'd, I want to make sure that as we're having this conversation, that we are addressing some of the um, issues that came up during the campaign. I mean, having kind of led the campaign on the board side, um, definitely want to make sure that we're um, speaking to some of the what I heard in many of the different forums and when I got questions from the community as we were trying to convince people to vote on this measure. But before that, I'm just going to open up to other board members to, if they have any questions or comments on this item. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm, I'm supportive of this. It's good news that we've moved past uh, the delay. Uh, that was none of our doing. I, I did want some specificity and it may need to be part of the recommended actions. I recognize that the the million uh, for the parks capital projects is determined by the board. Um, I believe that the intention of that is just to split that among each of the districts. I just wanted to make sure that that's specified that each each district will have that outlined as a, I suppose, $200,000 for each district and park funding. And so that way we at least can have it specified as, as the board direction. That would be my only uh, specific additional recommended uh, action on this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Supervisor Koenig. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. So it's wonderful to get the good news about the FEMA funding. It uh, seems like those moments are few and far between, but this is definitely a, a time to celebrate. Um, I'm supportive of the recommended actions. I think um, holding the Measure K funding uh, in reserve uh, through this winter is prudent, and I'm hopeful that uh, we have a dry winter and can look at proactive infrastructure investments with that money in the future. Supervisor McPherson. Uh, oh, Michael. Yeah. This is uh, this too is a, a positive report. And I want to thank our federal and state partners uh, that work to secure great, well, especially our, for, uh, our federal partners for the FEMA reimbursement for our COVID expenses. Uh, that's great news. Uh, I want to thank the CAO too for his leadership. Uh, our Measure K um, expenditures as split up as uh, was just mentioned by Supervisor Friend um, is for parks. Um, and uh, and then also addressing the again roads and homelessness and housing. I support the effort to restore our general fund contingencies. Um, this is um, a good report, uh, one like we haven't had for a while uh, regarding the budget. So thank you, Mr. President Hernandez. First, I'd like to thank the staff and CEO's office for all the work that they've been doing, and you know, of course. Glad we got the reimbursements from FEMA, and uh, I'm supportive of this uh, of this budget, and so I'm glad to move forward too. 
All right. Well, I'll, I'll just start by thanking um, staff for the presentation on this item, and um, just want to thank the community for being supportive of Measure K because um, without this sales tax, you know, we would be finding ourselves in a in a pretty challenging financial situation. And so, just really want to thank the community for supporting this. Um, in addition to that, just want to thank our state and federal partners for working to help us secure more FEMA dollars, and hopefully, we can get all our debt paid off sooner than later. Um, so that we can continue to move forward in a, in a more positive fiscal situation. Um, so I guess my question, and this might be obvious, but I'm just going to just for the record. So the decision that we're making today on these funds and kind of how they're being allocated, we will be able to revisit these in the future, in future budgets. Is that correct? These aren't going to be, you know, directly allocated for these this types is, of services moving right. forward. You're correct. So this is just in this current year budget. So 2024-2025. Great, thanks. Um, I guess I'd like to follow up um, maybe after today, just kind of better understanding how we landed on these various recommendations in terms of, you know, the Youth Home Keep Project, the um, Behavioral Health Bridge Housing Project, because, you know, I know that there's a lot of competing priorities and it would just be helpful to know, like, how, how are we landing on these specific um, recommendations and requests? And I say that because when I was um, out helping the campaign, on this um, for, the, for the sales tax, for example, meeting with COPA and some of the other folks who ended up supporting and helping to campaign on this too, you know, tenant protections was a very big thing that they were interested in seeing moving forward. And, you know, as we continue to try to, you know, um, convince our community to support us when we move forward with, with its sales tax or a housing bond measure, and that's just one example, we want to make sure that the things that we said we were going to invest in, that we're actually investing in those things and not kind of putting those to the side to invest in what may be, you know, a different priority for a different department or group of people. And so I just say that because I want, I know that, you know, um, those folks and we've heard from some other departments around, you know, having a full-time tenant um, defense attorney is something that folks, you know, when, when I was out campaigning and saying that that could be something we could invest in, that was something that a lot of people got excited about. And so just want to make sure that when, that as we're moving forward, um, we're really looking back at the, um, what we said we were going to do and trying to actually make sure that we're uh, following through with some of those um, requests that people are making during the campaign. Um, I also have a question regarding the um, parks funding, because as was shown in some of the language, you know, um, part of what we said we were going to invest in was, you know, environmental protection, along with parks, fire reduction. So I'm just wondering in terms of those funds, what we can, those funds can be used for. And, and again, it's really trying to be transparent with what we were advertising in our materials and really making sure that we're able to spend money on the things we said that we were convincing people that they should vote on this for. Yeah, so for the, the funds that are in capital projects currently, um, it, you are correct that, that we're designating, we're splitting that among each of the districts, so 200,000. But those are really, that's just a placeholder. So if there are things you want to fund related to environmental protection, that might not be your typical infrastructure project for a park. Um, we can always move those funds somewhere else or to wherever they need to be. So they're currently just in a holding account until we figure out with you where you want them to go. Okay. I just wanted that to be clear because, for example, I'm already getting uh, emails about vegetation management in the, you know, in, in Bonnie Dune. And if we now have these funds available, it would be worth having a conversation with our parks director and with OR3 because if we can ship some funds from these different categories to meet some of the needs um, that might not be necessarily filled with parks, but we're under that umbrella of, you know, what we said the funds could be used for. I just want to make sure that we have that flexibility so we can be responsive to, up to um, we can be responsive to the concerns that are being brought to our attention. Yes, you do have that flexibility. Great. Great. All right. Well, um, with that, um, yeah, and then I guess it would be great to get an update um, maybe after the storms, you know, where we're at in terms of contingencies and what opportunities there might be and at what point in time we might be able to revisit spending that if it's not spent. I mean, I think we're, it's likely that we'll probably have some more disasters this year and maybe not just storms, but um, if there's funding left over, it would be great to get an update on, you know, when the time comes on how we could better utilize those funds for other things. Okay. Yeah, we should, we should know by April. 
um, how, you know, because March is when we have the last storms, basically. So by April, we should we should be able to come back to the board. Okay. All right. I'll move the recommended actions just with the additional direction on the breakdown by district for the parks funding and that there's a return in April on the contingency funding usage. Second. All right, we have a motion by Supervisor Friend, second by Supervisor Hernandez with additional direction provided by Supervisor Friend. And with that, I'll ask the clerk to please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. McPherson and Cummings. Aye. That passes unanimously. And that brings us to the end of our meeting. And so just want to thank everybody for all their hard work. Thank you all for joining us. And we will see you in October. <laughs>